Let's see if this works. There, uh, there are many different ways to get your audience silenced, but I haven't found the correct way to do it. Um, it's always, you can try and make a joke, but half the audience will not understand your joke. Or you can do shush, which is very unpleasant, so they uh, simply stand there, start to talk, and typically people will stop. Um, it's a pleasure to see all of you back, many different people. I was just saying to uh, Christina that, that after all these Zoom meetings, you uh, forget how tall someone is. You forget that there's more to a person than just a face. And, uh, well, we don't forget, but it's interesting to, uh, to see all of you, to be able to communicate with each other in an informal way. And if ever the uh, general conference, the annual conference of the AGM was an event in which to socialize, in which to network, this is by far the best proof of the fact that, uh, yeah, that we need this. We need the opportunity to, uh, to talk to each other. We need the opportunity to meet in person. And we need the opportunity to exchange in a slightly less formal manner than, uh, than Zoom and all the other uh, options force us to do. Um, I welcome you on behalf of the board of AEGM. Christina Meri and Mats Tung Tangustunu are here. And we have tried to continue our work to the uh, best of our knowledge, and I welcome you in absence of Mayam Wenzel. It will not be a secret anymore, but Mayam is, uh, COVID is not gone yet, and Mayam is, uh, was, wrote to us how sad she was that she has COVID. I think it was on Friday that she sent us the message, and of all the discussions that we had, the one discussion that we had most between Mayam and myself and Mayam and the board was how eager she was to show everything that has been done here in the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. And when you've had your tours this morning, you have had an opportunity to see how important the work of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt is, and not to have the uh, leader of it all in, uh, in person is a sad occasion. It is what it is. Uh, Mayon will, of course, address us afterwards uh, through Zoom and uh, She'll, or through the, uh, through the screen at least, it's not Zoom, it's not a technology, but she will be addressing us in slightly longer than myself. So this is the first time since the pandemic, and uh, it's also our first summer conference, I think, at least in many years. And the, uh, I would be, uh, and believe we, we, we don't have to underline to what extent this summer today. Um, the, uh, it's something that, that we as a board are interested in understanding for you. To what extent would you feel that the uh, June option for an annual conference is a better option or a worse option than the, uh, than the November conferences that we typ typically would have? I think it's a very important uh, question. We are still, this, um, this is a giveaway, we're still looking for a uh, site for a host for 23 because for all sorts of political reasons, which I don't have to explain, uh, we most likely will not be going to Moscow next year, and the, uh, the, uh, which is not meant, meant to be a joke, it's very sad, but it's, uh, but it's also, the, it's also and it's very sad for the colleagues there especially, but it's, uh, it's, it's the fa a fact of life. For 24, we do have a venue, uh, which we will uh, announce then in our uh, uh, general meeting. Uh, but any of our colleagues who feel inclined to uh, take over small amount of work that went, that goes into a uh, <laughs> conference like this, uh, please move forward to us, come up to us, and we will be happy to uh, work together with you. Uh, it's also not over the pandemic because part of our conference will be shown online. Uh, it has the advantage of, of yeah, being able to, uh, to, to take in more colleagues than we would typically have, colleagues who don't feel comfortable to travel, colleagues who are not in the position to travel, colleagues who are not in the medical position or in the political position to travel, financial position to travel. There's been a lot of effect of the pandemic on many of our institutions. And it's an opportunity for our American colleagues to join in. And the, what I like about the, uh, about the, the, the hybrid, uh, hybrid format that we have chosen here also is that the, the parts that we show online uh, also have a digital afterlife. So it's not uh, just for now, but you can look it back and others who have not been able to watch can, uh, can watch it back. 
We did a lot of activities online. We tried as well as we could within the limited opportunities that we have as AEGM. Uh, we organized two conferences online. We organized a number of special online events. And it was always good to see that there were dozens and dozens of colleagues who wanted to join and who took the opportunity. So that was very rewarding and gratifying for us. We did CAPs online, the, the, curatorial, the curatorial programs. We did educational activities within the framework of MEST. So we had a lot of things going on at the same time. Uh, but we also came to the conclusion that this sets an enormous demand on the quality of our website, which is something that we have uh, taken on. Uh, the, we will be working on our website and we invite all of you now already not only to, uh, to tell us what you expect from us in terms of the networking capacity of our website, but also to, uh, to join us in making this website one of the places where you want to go when you want to know what is going on in Jewish museums. And another, I would say, positive uh, side effect of the pandemic, thank God there are positive side effects, uh, is that we are intensifying our relationship with KGM, with our colleagues from the Council of American Jewish Museums. Uh, we have had a, an online conference together. There's a much more intense contact between the boards of, of KGM and ourselves, and we're looking forward to continue that uh, conversation. Of course, we are also happy to even have a couple of Americans among our audience. Who would have thought? Um, we have secured funding from the, uh, from the Rothschild Foundation Hanadiv Europe, uh, who also provided some of you with uh, travel grants. So the, uh, it's a continued cooperation with the Rothschild Foundation, which is really the backbone of our financial structure. We have a number of other important initiatives that have separate funding, but without the, and that have separate substantial funding. Norway grants for the MEST, the Auschwitz uh, Amt, the German Foreign Office for the educational, for the CAP. But it is important to, to underline that this is long, this year-long relationship with the Rothschild Foundation Hanadiv Europe that provides the, uh, the AGM with a solid basis to do the work that we can do. Um, again, any suggestions for other parties that might be willing to support us, don't forget uh, that we are constantly looking for a continuation of our, continuation of our support. We're very happy that the David Burke Foundation in, uh, in New York has allowed us to, uh, to do an online presentation for all the plenaries. The plenary sessions will be broadcasted online. The, uh, the, the working groups will not be. Um, and yeah, this, this Congress, is the way that we have phrased it, we have been talking a little bit about crisis already, about other things. Congress is the result of a very intense cooperation with the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt, with Mirjam Wenzel, who will talk to you afterwards, and with their staff, first and foremost with Jonathan, Jonathan Günther, but also a lot of other members of the staff here who did an enormous amount of work. And actually, I want a round of applause for Jonathan and all the work that he did. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, we know what is necessary in the background. And I also want to thank my co-board members, Christina and Mats. And a special shout out to Kamala Dubrovska, who cannot be here, was part of our uh, board also during the pandemic. But uh, she is formally a Pauline, formally in our board as a result. And uh, we have two new proposals for members of the board, which will be presented during the annual conference. So we'll have a board that is a little bit bigger than the board that we now have, which is not necessarily a disadvantage, I can tell you. Uh, there's also a special word of thanks due to Anna Kahen. Some of you might have uh, asked themselves why is Anna not around? Well, Anna is pregnant. Her pregnancy is, is I was, I'm allowed to say everything I'm gonna say here. Her pregnancy is, is, uh, is, is hard, and she was told by a doctor not to, uh, not to come to Frankfurt and not to work uh, too hard, especially not with this kind of temperature. So we wish her not only a wonderful uh, period of pregnancy, but also hopefully a wonderful, a wonderful child and everything that comes with it. And I also want to thank Anna for all the work. And I happen to know that she's online. So and when, while we have been applauding, why not repeat the applaud and do it for Anna? <laughs> um, so Mirjam uh, will I join me. I mean, I have already joined me. I'm in our gratitude for the uh, for the sponsors. I think it's it's important to continue to underline this. We cannot do the work without this. There's also, and we're thinking of other ways to deal with it. This is a very 
we, you can't do the work of, of AGM without money. I mean, this is uh, the world that we live in. It's always been like that. And the, uh, it's one of our main concerns, the continuation of the work that we're doing. And one of the things that we were thinking about is how to uh, convince perhaps some of the biggest, to perhaps have some sort of a, of a uh, how do you say it in English, a layered uh, system by which uh, institutions contribute to AGM so that the really bigger institutions for which the 450 euros that you're now paying is, is close to nothing and the smaller institutions stay where, stay where we are and we can get a little bit more money like that. But we're also constantly looking for more funding. It's hard work. It's very important to continue to do it. So Mayan will... Uh, continue and will repeat these uh, thanks. We have, of course, coordinated who's saying what. Miriam, Miriam will also go into more detail as to the, uh, uh, the, the program and the way that the program was devised. In the past, typically, the program, the, 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 I would say the, the EGIS behind the program was typically with the, uh, with the board of AGM. This is an example of a more joint cooperation. We have had intense discussions on what to include and what not to include. We've tried to devise the uh, conference slightly differently from what we used to do in the past. We will, uh, which, and, and we hope that this is a format that will work. We welcome your comments. You will also be asked for your comments. And uh, Miam will be going into more detail how we uh, devised the pro program and what is the nature of our program. The very floor that I'm standing on is Miriam's floor. It's not our floor. And uh, I welcome her to this floor, if, not, if, only, uh, if only in the digital manner. It's very sad that you cannot be here, Miriam. I don't know if you already see her. I see nothing. I see the back of the screen. Um, and we are very impressed already, Miriam. We, we miss you a lot, but we're very impressed already with the entirety of your staff and all the work that has been done here. It's been a very smooth beginning uh, of a conference that was uh, yeah, that is a, no, a, a novelty also also for AGM to be to 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 work as intensely as we did in the and we have been working with so many partners. But this is a wonderful example. So, Miriam, we uh, are looking forward to what you have to say to us and. Uh, before I give you the floor, there's one very practical remark that I also have to make. Uh, we have a, a dinner event, a dinner reception at the end of our day. There's two ways to get there, by foot, if you're willing to, uh, if, if, you, if you don't expect to succumb to 30 degrees uh, temperature, then then Rivka Einwohner will, uh, will actually walk. Where's Rivka? Rivka is in the back of our room, so follow Rivka if you want to go for the 20-minute walk approximately, I've been told, whatever. the. Okay, so the uh, so so it's, it's actually a nice brisk walk. Let's put it that way. Uh, or Sarah Susan, who will actually take the underground, and Sarah is in the other part of the show. So so look for either of them, or go by yourself. Be there in time. It's important not to come too late. We uh, appreciate the invitation that we got, and I wish you a wonderful continuation of the next three days. And I continue the great pleasure in seeing all these wonderful faces. Thank you very much. So I assume I can start to speak. Thank you, Emil, for your kind words. I, I was listening to you. Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Jewish Museum Frankfurt in the frame of this year's AGM conference. As you heard already, I can't be with you in person in the upcoming days due to a COVID infection. And I'm really sad about this because I was looking forward to meeting and presenting our museum to you for a very long time. But as you all know, a museum is not run by its director alone, but by a team of colleagues, which is in the case of the Jewish Museum Frankfurt, a particularly excellent one, so that you will probably hardly realize my absence in the upcoming days. As those of you who took part in the tours that my colleagues were offering this morning might have heard already, the Jewish Museum Frankfurt is the first communal museum dedicated to Jewish history and culture that opened in West Germany after the Holocaust. It opened in 1988 in one of the former houses of the Rothschild family, the neoclassical Rothschild Palais. The first changing exhibition curated by Felicitas Heimann Jelinek 
and the founding documents took reference to the first Jewish museum in Frankfurt, the Museum of Jewish Antiquities, which opened in 1922 and was destroyed in the November pogrom in 1938. Most of the collection of this museum was looted. Some parts were restituted to Jewish institutions all over the world. Only a very small part that belonged to a private collector at the time is now part of the Jewish Museum Frankfurt's collection and on view in Museum Judengasse. The second location of the Jewish Museum Frankfurt opened in 1992 and underwent together with Rosh Hashanah recently a profound renovation. The renewal process of the Jewish Museum Frankfurt took place in the years 2015 till 2020. It consisted in the restoration of the Museum Judengasse and the Rothschild Palais, as well as in the curation of a permanent exhibition in two parts, one called Maslen Broche, dedicated to Jewish daily life in early modern times, and on view in the remnants of five houses of the oldest Jewish ghetto in Europe, Frankfurt's Judengasse. The second part of the new permanent exhibition is presented on three floors in the restored Rothschild Palais and has the title, We Are Now Jewish Frankfurt from Emancipation Until Today. Beside the curation of these two exhibitions, the renewal process consisted in the construction of a new building by Stab Architects from Berlin, where you are standing right now or sitting. This new building, a distinct monolith, takes up the shape of the natural landscape of the former Rothschild Garden and opens to the space of the city with its large windows that let the light in. That's why we called it light building. The new museum square between the Rothschild Palais and the light building is named after Bertha Pappenheim, a courageous woman who fought against trafficking and for women's rights at the beginning of the 20th century here in Frankfurt. The sculpture untitled that is now the landmark of this square, it was created by Ariel Schlesinger and enabled by the Rothschild family. The whole new museum complex, the restored Rothschild Palais with its new exhibition, The Light Building, the Museum Square recently won the Nika Award, a prestigious recognition by the German Association of Architects that has been given every three years to a new building that encourages social engagement and is convincing in its symbolism and composition. I hope that you will enjoy your time in this beautiful venue in the upcoming days. Please don't miss to spend some time on the terrace of the floor daily and take a look at the library above the hall. These are my two favorite places. The Jewish Museum Frankfurt has used the opportunity of its profound renewal to develop a new mission statement which shapes our museum work. At the core of this statement lies the conviction that our work is distinctly social, both in the physical realm and in the digital sphere, and that we need to raise sensitivity for our diverse cultural backgrounds in order to enable a secure and flourishing future for Jews in Europe. We are working towards this goal by defining ourselves as a museum without walls that is involved in educational work outside of our premises, active in digital communication, sensitive for matters of inclusion, and enjoys experimental formats that bring along new experiences and reflections. One of these experiments is currently on view in the changing exhibition below you on the topic of revenge in Jewish cultural history. The show offers new perspectives ranging from biblical stories, rabbinical writings, and Jewish legends to Jewish bandits. It thereby addresses anti-Jewish myths of Christian origin as well. Starting from Quentin, Tar Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, it refers to pop culture narratives, while its vanishing point are the final testimonies of those that perished in the Holocaust and the pending question of justice after what happened. The show is as daring as this year's conference program, which I would like to elaborate on a bit at last. As you might have noticed, this is the first hybrid conference the AGM has organized so far. And it is the first physical conference of the AGM since the beginning of the pandemic. <coughs> the pandemic itself, the psychological, social, and financial impact it has brought along 
is the first point of implicit reference of this year's program, which is shaped by the conviction that we are living in times of profound crisis. <clears throat> this crisis has now turned violent and existential in Europe due to the Russian invasion into Ukraine. As you all know, the AGM is a European network by Jewish Museum throughout Europe including both states, Russia and Ukraine. Nevertheless, in preparation of this year's conference, we felt the need to address the situation the war has brought upon the people of the Ukraine, its cultural institution and its Jewish heritage as such. This is why we've devoted a panel to the topic this afternoon. Besides this panel, the whole program is shaped by the conviction that we need to find adequate responses in our museum work to the current crisis and even more to elaborate on possible paths that may lead to a stable future for the societies we live in as a whole. <clears throat> Therefore, the, the program is addressing several symptoms of the crisis and offers possible perspectives how to solve or respond to them. Beside the war in Ukraine, this includes the question, how to address anti-Semitism or on the impact of identity politics on our respective institutions. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little with my COVID. Oh. Crisis lead to a redefinition of the core values of our work. That's why we integrated a panel on the topic of museum and communities. A workshop on provenant research and a presentation of core exhibitions and the question what we need them for in the program. I need to swallow something, just a second. you believe me now that I'm sick. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> and of course, the reflection on crisis leads to a talk on strategies, how to overcome them. This is why Barbara Kirschenblatt is opening this year's conference with a keynote on museums and resilience, and why we have a roundtable discussion on museums' positions towards the future tomorrow. I wish you all inspiring discussions and fruitful new reflections in the frame of this year's conference program. Miriam, if you want me to, I can also take over because you have your text in front of me. You, you, you tell me, you tell me maybe what you Emil, prefer. Maybe Emil, that would be a solution sure. because it's not okay. getting better. Okay, no, I was, I was slightly um, aware of that. And now it's for the thank you. So thank you for listening, and please and enjoy the conference. So thank you, Miriam. You, you, of course, you will stop coughing once you no longer have to talk. But this is. Uh, <laughs> This is how it is. So I will read the remainder of your text. Might happen. No, listen, you're only human, and, and one cannot be more human than in a situation of sickness that you're in. So don't, don't worry. I'll take over. Um, the, so we were with Barbara Kishenblatt, 
So this is why I'll take on the last sentence. This is why Barbara Kischenblatt is opening this year's conference with a keynote on museums and resilience, and why we have a roundtable discussion uh, on museum positions towards the future tomorrow. I wish you all inspiring discussions, you heard that. It is common that the organization of AEGM conference is undertaken by the organization and the programming by the hosting institutions. We were holding on to this work division in the preparation of this conference, which was quite a challenge because of all the changes that the pandemic brought about and the international scope of speakers' invitations was stretching the budget of the AEM to its limits. I would like to thank the board of AEGM in general, and she wants to thank me, it's very <laughs> funny to, in particular, uh, I don't know who this guy is, I don't, I don't remember the name, in, in particular for the constructive support and trust in the program, as well as Anna Kahen for the organizational work that she did. As you all know, this was the first major conference that Anna organized for AGM under particularly difficult circumstances. And I think she deserves, again, a special applause for this. So let's do that. And another person, and another applause is due to the special mention and all recognition to Jonathan Gunther. So let's give it up. Uh, so you might have received emails from him in the preparation of this conference, and he's probably standing close to the technical team right now. She's, you're actually perfectly right, Miriam, about that. He's working day and night in the past days to make the conference happen and deserves a special applause. Well, we took care of that twice. Um, the hybrid, uh, the hybrid, co hybrid conference mode is enabled by a long-term technical partner, Sasha Liefertz, and his team, and supported by the David, David Burke Foundation, uh, to whom I would like to express my sincerest gratitude, as well as to the Rothschild Foundation and the Deep Europe, who has profoundly supported AGM over the past decades. Last but not least, Miriam wants to thank her colleagues who have taken over the task of giving tours through the exhibitions or workshops to, on particular topics, and who will help you out in the upcoming three days. That's from the curatorial team of the Jewish Museum, Erik Riedel, Janis Lutz, Sarah Susan, and jo Johanna Weiss from the educational team, Antje Tool, Rivka Einwohner, Arwen Madavi, Sophie Schmidt, and Turkan Kabitschak, from the Library and Archive, Franziska Kra, and Linda Wiesner, from Communication, Rivka Kiebel, and Julia Aant, as well as Deputy Director, Michael Leonards. My heartfelt gratitude, Miriam's heartfelt gratitude, go to the Deputy Director, Eva Adlan, Adlan who prepared this, prepared this conference together with Jonathan and herself, and will take on the responsibility of representing the head of this museum right now. Furthermore, I would like to thank Risa, Risa Grimblad and Naomi Lubrik for replacing Miriam at a very short notice in chairing two panel discussions. And in the end, she would like to thank all of us, all you here present, dear colleagues, for coming to Frankfurt, to visiting our new museum, and for following, or for following this year's AGM conference online. I wish you all inspiring talks, lectures, and workshops, and all the best for future enterprises. And Mayam, we all wish you a lema, and please take care of yourself, and thanks for your brave effort, and uh, be convinced that this will be successful in spite of your well, for the, your, your strongly felt absence. Thank you very much. Actually, I can stay on here because I'm also the chair of the uh, next event. Barbara, you can turn on your camera. That was the sign that I was supposed to give. So Barbara should turn on the camera. And if she does, you will all be able to see her. <coughs> so I'll first give her, there she is, well it's the uh, only part of her, there you are Barbara, very good to see you. So um, welcome Barbara Kirchenbach Kimler, we have a lot of speakers today who for, especially for this particular audience, not really need an introduction, but of all the people who do not really need an introduction, uh, Barbara is the one who needs the least of an introduction of all of them. Um, so we are very proud, Barbara, to have you here. You're the uh, professor. Well, you have to take care of me very well. You're the um, you're a professor emerita at New York University for performance studies. You're a distinguished professor emerita, emerita if, I'm, if I'm correct. And of course, you're also the uh, chief curator for the core exhibition at Pauline uh, Museum in, in Warsaw. And besides that, you're the uh, yeah, you're the leading person, the leading lady of our field, the leading intellectual uh, in the field of museum studies and, uh, and, and a lot of other studies in the field of cultural studies. We're very proud 
that we can always ask you to join us, that you are always willing to share your particular experience and knowledge and insight and everything with us. We look forward to a wonderful, th wonderful talk about museums and resilience, and I invite you to live up to this introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Emil. Um, I'd like to begin by congratulating Miria Wenzel on this enormous achievement in the renewal and the expansion of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, and to wish her a complete and speedy recovery. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers of this year's AEJM for the opportunity to speak with you. I only wish that I could be with you in person. Now, my topic today is museums and resilience, but I would like to add another word to the title of my talk, and that is relevance. <clears throat> if there was ever a time when museums and Jewish museums in particular were relevant, it is now. It is during this, this extraordinary period. And uh, I know that we will be devoting a session later in the conference on Ukraine, uh, but I think that it is a, a prime opportunity for us to consider these topics. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm hoping that this will, this will work. Let's see. Yes, it's working. Okay. Okay, I'm hoping this will come up. Yes, okay. As I have been thinking about museums and their resilience and their relevance during the last three years, uh, well, almost three years, which has been a time of crisis on many, many fronts. It's been a time of crisis in terms of the pandemic. It's been a crisis in terms of the war in Ukraine. It's been a crisis in terms of climate change and the uh, impact of all of these things on the economy and on people's everyday lives. I keep on returning to the question of what is a museum and why does it matter? And specifically, why do Jewish museums matter? <clears throat> so let me begin with the issue of defining museums, uh, because I, I do think that it's a useful touchstone for our, our deliberations today. So we know that the current definition, 2007, it really does not in any way in my, to my way of thinking, reflect where museums are, or, or certainly where the museums that interest us the most, where they find themselves in a time of crisis. Because the current definition does not in any way account for crisis. That is a nonprofit non permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, conserves, communicates, exhibits, heritage, and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. This presupposes a very peaceful world. It in no way, it, is, it in no way positions museums to address crisis and to address crisis in the sense of the crisis they, that museums themselves face and the crisis that museums address. So crisis in those two senses. And this definition does not in any way imagine such a situation and provide for them. Now, finally, after many, many efforts to craft a definition that could be presented to uh, the members of ICOM uh, for a vote, we have the, the, the current proposed museum definition, which is uh, the result of a long process that has, if I may put it bluntly, eviscerated the uh, I would say activist aspect of the earlier proposed definitions, which are much more oriented, I would say, to the issue of crisis that we will be addressing today. So the current proposed museum definition for the vote is it's still not for profit, it's still permanent, it's still in the service of society, it still does all the things that the 2007 definition um, says, but it adds some core values, accessible, inclusive, fosters diversity, sustainability, communicates ethically, et cetera, but it's still about education, enjoyment, ref reflection, and knowledge sharing. In other words, it, it too, um, if you will, does not position museums to deal with crisis, the dual crisis of the crisis they face themselves. 
the crisis that they face themselves and the crisis that they try to address. Barbara, so, Barbara, let me let me shortly interrupt you, Barbara. Is, is there a way for you? Be, you're showing your pres presenter screen right now and not the full screen. Can you switch oh, your screen? Oh, Can you switch okay, your screen? Okay, just one second. Let me just see. I'm trying to figure out what is the problem. Just a second. Let me just see what's the problem. Um, is are the slides not moving? No, the slides are moving, but what you're showing is your. I, I, I have actually a different screen. Is it okay now? It's not. No. So what you're sh what you're showing is your presenter screen. So the one that has all the slides on the side, and not the sh the screen. There's okay. Can you can you see? Uh, what do you see now? We see. Oh, you don't see anything at the moment because I'm not. Sh oh, I am sharing. Um, do you see uh, the proposed museum definition slide? Yeah, we see three slides on the left and your side on the right, slide on the right. And when you when okay. you work when you're working from Zoom, right, there's an second. option to change you, the screens. Uh, yeah. Just give me a moment. Do you now see a full slide? Nope. No. Okay. So let me go back to. Um, it's not yeah, ideal, this is, yeah, but I think no, it may be our only solution. So. But now um, you're back to, you to the wrong one. You can now see a full now, slide, even though you see the ones on the side, right? No, you're, you're, now, now we're seeing the wrong one again, but you did it for a split second. So you did something right, you did everything right, but you did something right for a split second. Give it a so, shot. Sorry? You did something sorry? right. We saw, we saw the full screen for a split second, and then you moved it back. Okay. So um, do you see the next slide now? Yeah, but not... Put the one on the put yeah put the one on the, that yeah, the, yeah exactly at the bottom of at the I'm sorry I'm not able uh, the, okay the, I will, uh, I will, I will at the bottom of your at, at the bottom of your screen I think that uh, there's that there the, the four or five and one one of them is a slide presentation there's one two to the left of that that you should click and it will move I think give it a I'm try. sorry I'm not I can't I can't hear you so I can't the, understand. Uh, so I will do it a little bit slower. The um, the the the, the, bot the button you, that you typically use to have a screen, the full screen presentation at the bottom. Uh, there's there's two two left of that is another button which you should I think press and then the problem is solved. Sorry, s say that again. So the button at there's, there's there's a number of buttons at the bottom. One one that gives you a full screen. I, no, I know this is the, uh, here. I had I, I this is the full screen. Just one second. Can you, do you see a full screen now? No. Uh, because you, there's also two, two, two buttons left of that, two or three buttons left of that is another one which you should click. Yes. Okay, just no. one second. No. There are two, all right. Um, you did it for a second again. Now? Yeah, yeah, this is it. Perfect. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm very sorry. Okay, okay. So we have uh, the, the old definition, the current definition, and the one in 2019, which was an activist definition, and it was rejected. And that is to say there was no consensus uh, regarding this particular one, but it, and in fact, better captures the moment in which we find ourselves. And that's what I'd like to address. In other words, that museums not only do all the things that the other new definition proposes, but they also acknowledge and address conflicts, challenges of the present, safeguard diverse memories for future generations, etc. So that aspect, that kind of activist aspect was um, difficult for many, many museums in the ICOM uh, world to accept, and that was dropped, which I think is actually quite unfortunate. So let me turn to the question of relevance. And that is, who are we? Who are we for? And why do we matter as museums, as Jewish museums, as European Jewish museums? And what I'd like to do is to try to suggest possible, if you will, avenues for answering these questions with regard to the two major crises that we as museums have been facing in the last three years which is of course the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. So um, I think quite early in, the, in terms of the, of the pandemic, 
there, there were discussions of the role of museums in times of crisis. And that um, I think is a, a question that should in fact be, if you will, folded into our understanding of what museums are and why they matter. And why they matter in times of crisis may help us to, re to re redefine what they matter in times that are not times of crisis, assuming that any time is not a time of crisis. And so um, Erica Lehrer and Shelley Butler were reflecting on this question. And this is a rather American perspective, which is object restitution, community, although of course the European as well, but the overwhelming whiteness of museums, the opioid crisis, fossil fuel ex extraction, in other words, climate change. There are many, 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 many issues that are pressing issues, although they are not at the forefront in the way that COVID and the war in Ukraine are, and in the way that there has been a kind of massive mobilization of museums in addressing these two really pan, uh, essentially pan world crises. But, but in fact, one could say that museums are in a position to address many crises without making crisis what defines them. So let me start with, with COVID. And that actually presented a kind of existential crisis to museums themselves because they were forced to close. They closed, they opened, they closed. They had to uh, put in place many safety precautions, social distancing, masking, limiting of the number of visitors, reduction of hours. Um, they had to cope also with the, the health and of their staff. Um, so, I would say that the first crisis that museums had to address and to which they had to be resilient was in essence an existential crisis, loss of earned income and, and many, many other ways in which their operations were really severely, severely affected. But at the same time, and this is, it seems that wherever there's a crisis, there's an opportunity to, if you will, uh, rally um, xenophobia and of course anti-Semitism is at the forefront. And so we had disinformation, we had the, the mobilizing of xenophobic attitudes and also in fact actions. And, we, and this is the case not only with COVID but as you'll see also with Ukraine. But what I find most interesting and I think where I look for the relevance of Jewish museums in particular is around what I would call rethinking the present. That the way in which uh, a period of crisis forces us to rethink the present. In other words, in a period of crisis, we experience the present as already historical, even before it has become past. And we know this well from the period of the Holocaust and of course, the classic, the, if you will, the touchstone is the uh, Oinik Shabbos archive, the Warsaw Ghetto Underground Archive. So this is a way um, that what crisis does is it, if you will, presses us to experience the present prospectively. In other words, imagining what today will look like when we look back on it in the future. So there is a way in which crisis provokes a, a particular kind of historical consciousness in the moment with an eye towards a day to come when we will look back on the present. In other words, we experience the present as already historical and there are things that we do in light of that his kind of historical consciousness. And what that means is that we collect, or if you will, we have the opportunity, perhaps the moral responsibility to collect the present, which means in many cases to collect the ephemeral, not only the ephemeral, but this is a very, this is very different from what I would call 11th hour salvage collecting, uh, which is, has been um, a largely an ethnographic project to, because the 11th hour salvage collecting was, a, there was a sense that uh, if you will, a traditional Jewish way of life was uh, disappearing and that we had to somehow rather document it and collect it before it vanished altogether. But that's very, very different from 
collecting an ongoing situation in the present that will become past but is not yet. And so we are, in a way, invited to rethink the past. As Faulkner uh, wrote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And so my starting point for thinking about this uh, kind of historical consciousness, this experiencing of the present as already historical, my touchstone for this is the Oinik Shabbos archive, the Warsaw Ghetto Underground Archive that was organized by Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto. And this year on April 19th, the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, there was the unveiling of a commemorative, uh, essentially in a, a memorial to the, war, to, to the Oinik Shabbos archive, to this extraordinary secret uh, clandestine archive um, by marking the, one of the places where it had been buried and was recovered from the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto after the war. And this uh, quotation from a teenager, from David Graeber, who was a member of the archive in his last will and testament, uh, he wrote, what we could not shout out to the world, we buried in the ground. And this, so this sense that, uh, that, the, that there was a, a moral obligation and an urgency to record everything in real time in situ, in, in the place itself. That kind of historical consciousness is something that we're living with now and that gives to Jewish museums an extraordinary, and to museums more generally, extraordinary relevance. So let me give you some examples from the COVID period. I wanna take one example. Well, I've got more than one, but one example that I find particularly interesting, and that is the, the face masks, because they are, I would say, an icon of the objects that are produced in the midst of this crisis and that become flashpoints for what I would call the, uh, our relevance and what we can offer um, in this period. So um, there, there were a whole series of uh, face masks that took inspiration from Jewish sources. Um, there where we live, that is our land, that is our home. And this of course is inspired by a poster from the Bund uh, during from the interwar year period. Um, of course, I think those who buy the masks don't necessarily recognize where the image or where the, where the quotation comes from. But there was another extraordinary uh, example from Ken Goldman, an artist living in a kibbutz in Israel, where he, he actually took inspiration from a 19th century amulet that was an amulet against the plague. And it's this amulet uh, that appeared in a, uh, it actually appeared in a book uh, but it was specifically an amulet against the plague. And so it, it is another, I think, very interesting example of, if you will, drawing from Jewish sources in the context of a, of a crisis and around actually an extremely contentious object. Now, what makes this object so contentious? And that is its politicization and the, I would say, instrum instrumentalization and misuse of the Holocaust. And there was a young man in the Midwest who created what he called Holocaust face masks, where um, he, and he, on his website, and I actually engaged in email correspondence with him to try to better understand what he thought he was doing. But what he was doing is actually much more complicated than it appears. But essentially what he did was to print images, in this case from the strip report, of the Germans suppressing the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, of the crematoria at Auschwitz. And he printed them on these masks as um, a way of, I would say, conflating and of course, without a full understanding, without an understanding of what, uh, in my view, of what he was doing, of a conflation of the, if you will, what they would call, what he would call tyranny of the Holocaust and the quote, tyranny of mask mandates. And we can see that here uh, extended also to the politicization of vaccination. And of course, our role in com you know, communicating effectively about the Holocaust is absolutely critical, whether or not that would affect these kinds of misappropriations is another question. But also there were some extraordinary vernacular 
responses to COVID. In this case, this is this COVID khala, which is an extraordinary, my way of thinking, an extraordinary object. But there are many, many more examples of, I would say, ver uh, vernacular responses to the to, to the to the pandemic that are are ripe for documentation for collection and with an eye towards how they might be used in the future as museums and Jewish museums in particular reflect on the period of the pandemic and reflect on it in terms of I would say resilient responses but also responses that um, misappropriate the Holocaust responses that promote anti-Semitism and xenophobia, but they are, I would say, a call to document and collect. That, that would be one of the major takeaways from the materials that I've been looking at in relation to, to COVID. Of course, there's much more that museums can do and did and continue to do during this period. Now, of course, um, one, of the, one of the most important ways that museums uh, were, if you will, resilient, was to move so much of what they do online. And they did so in a wide variety of ways and expanded their audiences greatly. And I think we'll probably continue uh, to do so even as they are open and encourage visitors to visit them on site. So uh, some other examples of, if you will, collecting the present. And in this instance, um, the hostage crisis, the anti-Semitic a hostage crisis at Congregation Bethel in Colville, Texas this year. Um, there are two objects that they gave to the National Museum of American Jewish History, and those are the cup and the chair, uh, because, and this is extraordinary, the stranger was welcomed with a cup of tea and the rabbi managed a daring escape by throwing a chair at him. And these two objects will then become, if you will, touchstones, kind of objective correlatives uh, for this particular event. But there, there are many, many more examples, but they are, if you will, examples of anticipating a moment or a time in the future when we would, we would want to be able to reflect on these events and would wanna have the materials to do so. But right now, we are right in the midst of the war in Ukraine. And it, it, th this is what I would like to conclude with. And it, in a way, as a introduction to the panel on Ukraine and the war in Ukraine that will take place tomorrow. And it seems to me that a, uh, a critical asset that, that Jewish museums have is their ability to provide a Jewish lens if you will, a Jewish historical lens on current events. And I know that the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the uh, Pauline Museum in Warsaw, and other, other Jewish museums uh, often state as one of their goals and as part of their mission to relate the histories they present to the present moment and to reflect on the present in light of the past and to reflect on the past in light of the present. And so that Tuning that Jewish lens, defining that Jewish lens is a huge opportunity uh, uh, for Jewish museums in a time of crisis. And in this instance, Jewish, uh, Jewish Museum Berlin did what museums are very good at, which is their power to convene, to provide a forum, to provide an open space for reflection. And in this instance, it was Jewish perspectives on the psychological and political ramifications, a panel discussion, and it involved historians. Now, the muse museums and Jewish museums in particular are more than spaces of reflection, which is really uh, wh what we get from the, the museum definitions, uh, certainly the most recent museum definitions and from the old museum definition, but there's much more to be done. And in this case, uh, I would say Ukrainian museums have been proactive in defining what it is museums can do to support, uh, uh, to, to basically support Ukrainians in defending uh, themselves in the war in Ukraine, the war on Ukraine. And of course, there's what can be done uh, for those who are in Ukraine and what, what can be done for those, for the refugees who have left Ukraine. And the first, the first is solidarity and support. 
which museums have museums and Jewish museums have definitely been actively doing, but that's actually not enough. And so this this is a uh, essentially a five point um, list of what museums can do, and much of it is getting the word out, showing solidarity, highlighting Ukrainian art, and this this is coming from the uh, the Arsenal Museum in Kiev. But the but there's much more that can be done. Certainly, this is the first step, but it's re it's really not enough. Um, I found it interesting that Curator, the Museum Journal, uh, made a real plea that the first priority should be to uh, should be people, and that and and I thought they made it in a very eloquent way. In other words, save the Ukrainian people first; they carry their culture in their hearts, and that the international museum community should focus on people and on saving the cultural heritage of Ukraine by pr prioritizing the safety of its people. And um, that, that can take a variety of forms. It can be very focused on the museum professionals and supporting them in their efforts to protect the, Ukraine, the heritage of Ukraine and whether in Ukraine or those who are refugees and who are living in Poland and other countries. Uh, so, I, but I thought that that um, that prioritizing uh, the Ukrainian people was a very, very smart and very, very important intervention. So we have many, 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 many examples uh, worldwide of expressions of solidarity with Ukraine, whether it's a hashtag, uh, whether it's a, a, um, a rebranding, if you will, in the colors of the Ukrainian flag. So these are uh, these are ways of getting the message out, whether it's in social media, whether it's in other media. But there are also specific actions that museums have been taking to raise funds, for example, concerts and other fundraising efforts. In this case, um, this was the Symphony of Var uh, Var Varsovia. Um, and the proceeds from the ticket sales were being donated to support a, a second effort, which was to provide hot meals for Ukrainian refugees staying in temporary accommodations in Warsaw. But museums also can play a very important role in bringing attention to the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict. And you know, on the one hand, there, uh, there, there is the issue of war crimes, and on the other, uh, there is the, the issue of the protection of cultural heritage. And I'm reminded of uh, Lemkin's definition of genocide as not only the extermination, the annihilation of an entire people, but also the destruction of their heritage. And that for him, um, the, the, the term genocide applied to both. And that's something that uh, I think museums are particularly sensitive to and that they can, they can address. And so uh, there are specific sites in Ukraine, uh, that is to say Jewish memorial sites and Jewish cultural sites that have been damaged during the war. And uh, of course there are protests, joint statements that are released by museums throughout the world in an effort to, to bring attention to this particular effort. So it's an, I would say that this is a kind of advocacy that is very specific to museums. Museums understand them. And these are signatories that are uh, all museums, not necessarily Jewish museums, but of course, Jewish museums are, are on the front lines. Uh, of course, the, the uh, destruction of the television tower on the edge of the Babanyar um, complex, uh, the ravine. Um, and then the, uh, the question that we can ask, this is the title of Sam Kassow's book, Who Will Write Our History and Who Will Remember the Horrors of Ukraine? And this, this, uh, the idea that it is not, we're not only in a position in, in a moment of crisis of experiencing the present is already historical, but we're already concerned with how the event will be remembered and with the creating, if you will, of, uh, of memorials, even before the event is over. And of course, that could be that can take quite a long time. So I was really impressed with the, the creating of, if you will, a museum uh, telling the story of a war that is still in progress with an exhibition called 
crucified Ukraine. And in this instance, it reminded me very much of 9-11 and the 9-11 Memorial Museum and the collecting of the evidence of the disaster. These are what in Sweden has been called in their armory, souvenirs of the wound. And these are brutal objects that bear the traces of extraordinary violence. And, but this idea of creating, you know, not only, if you will, the existential crisis of museums surviving, but the idea of creating a new museum new museum in the midst of the crisis. And so the idea of the Jewish lens, it seems to me is one of our great opportunities that the, uh, in this case, the ironies of history, the Ukraine crisis through the lens of Jewish history, this is the topic of a special issue of the Jewish Quarterly Review, but also the topic of uh, numerous um, panel discussions, lectures to in a way leverage Jewish history and the Jewish lens for understanding the current crisis and also reflecting um, on, on uh, if you will, the relevant aspects of, of Jewish history. Um, and of course, last but not least is the figure of, of Zelensky, where, uh, it, it, the, which is very linked to the issue of anti-Semitism and the, the, the ways in which uh, Jewish museums in particular, but not only, um, are, are very well positioned to address, I would say, xenophobia more widely, anti-Semitism in particular. And so here, the anti-Semitism Instagram page uh, highlights the, the, if you will, the Jewish heritage of Zelensky himself and connects it to, of course, to the Holocaust and to Putin's uh, outrageous denazification argument, which of course he's apparently now uh, shifted gears and uh, is this is not his major message anymore. But as with COVID, as with other crises, they are opportunities for a resurgence of uh, anti-Semitism in its most ugly forms. And, it's, and with it, a call to, to address hate more generally, anti-Semitism in particular. And so um, you can see here how in this instance, the, the Weizmann National uh, Museum of, the, of American Jewish History has actually made that connection very explicit. Jewish groups hope focus on Ukraine and anti-Semitism will draw attention to Jewish American Heritage Month. Now, um, American Jewish American Heritage Month hopefully is more than uh, and, and obviously has to be more than anti-Semitism, but it is um, there is a way in which the in this particular uh, museum, this particular Jewish museum in the United States, far from Europe and far from the front, whether the war front or the refugee front, is hoping to um, in a way, take advantage of the focus on Ukraine and anti-Semitism to draw attention to, to a much wider topic, which is Jewish history, Jewish heritage. Um, so let me conclude with uh, what Pauline Museum has been doing. And I know that tomorrow uh, other museums will also uh, showcase and shine a light on what they've been doing. So among the many things that that Pauline Museum has been doing, um, and that has been, uh, in a way, uh, I would say repurposing its cafe, its restaurant, Varsha, to prepare hot meals for refugees living in one of the uh, temporary um, shelters in, in Warsaw, and raising funds to do that. And it has been very successful and a very, very meaningful um, intervention. As you know, Poland, uh, over 3 million uh, Ukrainian refugees are being cared for in Poland. And uh, the care that they're being given is first and foremost by civil society. And that is really very, very extraordinary. It's a topic for a wider discussion. Um, as, um, our, uh, as other museums are doing, and I know that the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt, Berlin, many other Jewish museums are doing, and that is offering tours in Ukrainian for their permanent exhibition, for their temporary exhibitions, in their audio guides, and offering free admission uh, to Ukrainian refugees and, uh, and all kinds of programs uh, for them as well. 
Um, and which I found quite extraordinary, and that is that Poli Museum is partnering with Elnet Poland Foundation for uh, to, to an open open an open meeting entitled "Trauma and PTSD Induced by Hostilities," um, and working here with Israeli scholars that are specialists, particularly in relation to dealing with trauma and the Holocaust, which I thought was I had not seen anything quite like that elsewhere. But I thought that was a really um, very important uh, intervention. And so to conclude, um, what is it that, I mean, I would say, um, what are the more general uh, ways in which Jewish museums are not only resilient um, in terms of their own existential crisis, but resilient in relation to the crises that are facing the world, uh, that are facing uh, their communities, that are facing the countries on their borders? Um, and what is it that they are well positioned to do? Um, and I would uh, define uh, these as what I call 21st century competencies. The first is critical thinking. Uh, in, a, in, in a time of disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, exploitation of, um, I would say, of uh, hate, exploitation of national sentiments, um, uh, where there is uh, so, uh, if you will, um, ignorance and, if you will, arrogance, critical thinking, the ability to critically assess what you're hearing, what you're seeing, and to be able to think independently, this is I think a very important role that museums can play and can play that role in a, a voluntary setting, a setting to which people come voluntarily and a setting that is defined by what I would call informal learning. The second is media literacy, the ability to assess the sources of information, uh, whether they're social media, mass media, print, uh, we know that the, the, uh, the situation of information in Russia um, is so controlled by government propaganda that even when relatives in Ukraine are speaking with their relatives in Russia, their Russian relatives don't believe what they're telling them from the front. And so the, the issue of media literacy is of critical importance. And this too is something where museums are well positioned to intervene. Emotional intelligence. There is no way to address, I would say, anti-Semitism, xenophobia without emotional intelligence, without the capacity for empathy and the capacity for shame, the capacity to be, if you will, intelligent to one's own emotions and the ability to be intelligent to the emotions of others. Social responsibility. Uh, this is an extraordinary period in terms of the response of civil society to this crisis. And it is, I, I would like to think that the, that the expression and in action of the social responsibility that we're seeing from civil society, I would like to think that it will carry over. And museums and Jewish museums in particular are actually exemplars. They are models of, and, and can, can be, should be, and are currently models of social responsibility. Museums are a, a, a perfect, if you will, platform, portal, arena, um, I would say um, forum for informed debate. And what that means is that these, that debate which is informed uh, informed by reliable information, reformed by critical thinking, informed by media literacy, informed by emotional intelligence, informed debate and civil debate, debate that is uh, that that museums can actually model. And then the the um, examples of action. What can we actually do? That is to say, what museum? What museum? What can museums do? as museums, but also how can they help civil society to take appropriate action with the, if you will, ultimate goal of strengthening the resilience of civil society because 
civil society, that is to say, change and meaningful action from the grassroots up holds the greatest potential going forward. Thank you. We gave us a lot to think about. Couldn't have been more on the uh, on the. It's the core of what we, what all of us are thinking about at the moment. Uh, I would welcome questions from the audience before I otherwise fill that gap, uh, because I actually have a couple of questions. Is there anyone who would like to join us or have a question or a remark or whatever? It's always difficult to be the first to talk. Um, then, Barbara, I will speak very slowly, and then afterwards people will come. You can hear me right there, can't you? Yeah. So, Barbara, you hear me right, right? Yeah. Do you hear me, Barbara? Yeah. Doesn't look like, doesn't look like it. Can you arrange for... Is that possible? It should be working. So, the... Um, do you hear me, Barbara? Just nod. She doesn't. So how are we going to do this? Sorry? Yeah, I could, but the, uh, it should. Yeah, on Zoom, Jonathan, can you send her? They're working on it. I can actually hear the audience if the audience speaks up. Yeah, but you, you could hear me as well. Yeah. OK, very good. That sounds better. Um, and I think there are microphones also for the audience. And what I suggest is have, if you have questions, raise your hand. Still no questions. Um, and I, I, will, I will actually ask the first question, uh, Barbara. When I, I, the day before last, I was in, uh, day before yesterday, I was in Stockholm and I spoke at the, uh, at the conference that was organized at the, uh, at the event of the launch of a new Holocaust museum in, uh, in Stockholm. And one of the things that I spoke about is very similar to what you say here, which is the, the uh, authority that Jewish museums and also Holocaust museums of today, and not the Holocaust museums, I mean, the Holocaust museums today especially, but Jewish museums also have, um, the, uh, in, in terms of moral leadership also. So I'm, I'm very much, uh, I very much agree with the last list of comments that you have. But one of the things that I noticed there is that many of our, even Scandinavian colleagues where, I mean, all Scandinavian countries have their own set of problems, but they are free countries. The uh, problems that many of these institutions have to define themselves as institutions that can take on such a role in the public debate in the European setting. So some of the examples that you give show that, for example, Polish institutions, other institutions really do a wonderful job. But how you, do you see this, I would say, in a pan-European perspective? Um, not every European country uh, allows, or not every Jewish museum in a European country will feel the freedom to do uh, as you suggest, can you comment on that? Well, um, uh, what, what, what do you think limits the feeling that Jewish museums and Holocaust museums are not free to comment strongly in public on these issues? Well, the, the, the answer that I got in, uh, I, I think part of it is actually our next session, which is the extent to which the museums can operate independently of the communities that oftentimes support them. Part of it is the issue of um, the fact that many of our institutions are state museums where uh, the expectations or the mandate that they have does not necessarily include such a political eagerness. Um, how, where do you see the opportunities? How, how do you think they should be able to break that? Do, do you agree with me to begin with? Well, well, somehow I'm seeing a lot of museums that are state museums that are are being quite activist and, and being quite proactive. But in the case of Poland, the 
the, the, I would say the situation is extreme because more than 3 million refugees and this extraordinary response of civil society. And also it's a point of pride in the case of the Ukraine war, it's a point of pride um, that Poland, uh, when I say Poland, I actually mean Polish society first and foremost, is responding in this way. I think with COVID, it's a completely different story. It, you know, the contrast between those two situations, because they're the solidarity that we see with respect to Ukraine, we don't see with respect to COVID, which is highly politicized. And so um, not all crises are the same. Uh, and yeah, okay, so it's a long discussion. It's a difficult discussion to, to, to have with you on the screen, but the, uh, there's a question from the audience also. Uh, the, one second, please introduce, yeah, there's a microphone coming. Please mention your name and your affiliation, and then the question. Uh, hello, uh, Albert Stankowski, Warsaw Ghetto Museum. Hello, Barbara. I have a question, uh, because I'm now thinking, um, uh, because we are deal a lot of with the, uh, with the Ukrainian refugee to help them, but also I have a problem with, with my relation today with my colleagues from the Jewish Museum who are dealing with the Holocaust from Russia, because now this uh, relation are very fr the frozen, and I have a lot of also friendship there, uh, a lot of friends uh, who, with uh, whom I deal, and I'm now that are not accepted uh, the policy of Putin. But uh, how how we should to deal now in this situation? Thank you. Oh my gosh! Give, give I that, wish give I that had one a go, uh, uh, Barbara. No, give that one a go. Yeah. That that is a tough one. I you know I do know that there are. I mean, the way in which my colleagues are responding is they're either leaving uh, Russia completely or they're staying silent and just trying to stay out of trouble. But it's, um, that, that, that I think is in the current context, it's, it's such a specific situation and really intractable. I don't know. I just don't know. Let, let, let me add a little bit to that, um, Barbara, how we respond to that from the framework of the board of AGM. What we have decided so far is that on a personal level, on a one-to-one -one level with each of our colleagues working there, uh, we try to establish, we try to remain the contact and to, to stay in contact and to have the uh, normal working relationship with, with them to, as much as we can. Um, and But there's no form of cooperation at the moment that is thinkable for any of us other than uh, than supporting the individual. And uh, supporting the individual can mean staying in touch with them and giving the feeling that their colleagues see them. And supporting the individual can mean that you help them in doing what Barbara suggests, which is trying to find positions, as, as for the U U Ukrainian colleagues who want to leave, not all of them do, um, the, uh, just to be as supportive as, as we can and move along with the political situation. But as for, for formal cooperations with, with uh, Russia at the moment, it's of course impossible. But on a personal level, we want to continue that. Uh, are there any other? There is another question from the room. Your microphone is very much near you. So first name and affiliation, and then the question. Uh, Shelley Hornstein speaking. I hope you can hear me, yes? It's, you know, if you could maybe everybody stay a little bit further away from the microphone and there might be less, less distortion. I was saying, hi, Barbara. It's Shelley Hornstein. How are you? Hi, Shelley. <laughs> uh, I, I'm taking up your issue of relevancy with great interest. And I'm thinking, of course, from my perspective, architecture and the architectural or the physical plant of a museum and the notion of permanency, permanency of an architectural space versus the temporal, temporal nature of relevancy and its relationship to that physical plant. So I'm thinking, you know, off the cuff of JR, for example, in his recent uh, exercise, we could call it our project of moving around different cities within Europe and Ukraine with his image of the, the young girl and so on. Those kinds of temporally uh, affiliated projects are possible uh, 
the notion of immediacy, that is to say, with regard to relevancy. But I'm wondering what you think about that relationship of the physical plant to the temporary nature of relevancy, we could say. Well, um, actually, your question uh, prompted you to think along a couple of different lines, and that is, um, for, well, it, it not this is not directly connected, but um, I've been following the work of forensic architecture, which is extraordinary uh, because it is, on the one hand, it's uh, dealing with architecture in the very broadest sense of the physical built and not only built environment, but also the idea of a forensic approach to the environment as a form of documentation. And I would say that that's somewhere between permanent and temporary in the sense that these permanent structures by being destroyed in, and, 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 and by virtue of, I would say, atrophy um, become, if you will, uh, temporary. So there is this, I would say, as kind of a spectrum between permanent and temporary by virtue of the violence on the in, uh, on the built environment, so that that would be uh, one the one one issue. The second is that there are many many ephemeral interventions, uh, whether they're on the streets, whether they're in the form of posters, whether they are uh, small uh, interve protest interventions, performances. Um, there there are there there's a whole range of them that don't require a permanent built structure. Uh, so this issue of, I mean, in a way temporary, um, you know, actually what's interesting about that is the introduction of time into our discussion of space. That is a really interesting direction, which is to say that the ephemeral, which is something that we should be collecting, is by definition here today, gone tomorrow. It is by definition the most time sensitive material. You know, whether it's a photograph of a moment or it's a, a poster or some other, uh, something, some, some sort of tangible evidence of the moment. And so um, I, I, I guess I would respond by saying, I think it would be useful to think about the temporal aspect of uh, what we think of, when we think of museums, we think of them being durable, uh, enduring, uh, conserving. Uh, they're there forever and they're there to preserve forever, but we're actually in a moment where that's upended. So I think that's, that's really interesting. And uh, what I didn't mention and didn't show are the photographic projects, which I think are incredibly important. Um, and there's one in Poland, Chuck Fishman's uh, is, has been photographing the, the situation and the experience of Ukrainian refugees in Poland, especially in Krakow. But, but that, that the idea of introducing the, te the temporary, the temporal, um, is I think a really useful uh, way of going. Are there any other questions? from the audience since we have, we have a minute. I have one, one more question, Barbara, which is something that you indicated already, uh, but you mentioned toward the end of your talk that the, uh, well, you, you put a lot of stress on the role that we can play in combating the appropriation, the misappropriation of the whole, of a Holocaust, uh, of the Holocaust discourse, of Holocaust imagery, of Holocaust uh, terminology, ide this sort of negative ideology, anti-Semitism. One of the discussions that we've been, been having a lot in our Jewish museum now in the, in the preparations in Amsterdam, in the preparation of our uh, National Holocaust Museum, is the extent, extent to which the Holocaust takes over the entire narrative of your institution. And, the, and this is one of the big discussions that we have. And, the, um, and yes, I think that a, a proper response to, uh, to today's society can only be that you respond and you provide the audience at large with reliable information with the entire list that you, that you ended your talk with. But how do we counterbalance this, this, which is also part of our goal, which is a representation of Jewish culture in the past and also Jewish culture of today that is not connected directly to the negative, negativity of anti-Semitism and Holocaust? How do you see that? 
Well, actually, it's very interesting that you raise this issue because uh, most recently, uh, Israel has called off the visits of Israeli youth to Holocaust sites in Poland because the Polish government objects to the negative, uh, if you will, the exclusive focus on the Holocaust and the negative image of Poland that results from these trips. And they want to have some say as to the content of these trips. And I found that fascinating. And in the news coverage of this brouhaha, because these trips have been canceled and the money to the families refunded, in the brouhaha, the, um, in Haaretz, there was a very interesting article that, that said that these trips are more about Israel than they are about the Holocaust. And that um, it's unfortunate that there isn't a greater emphasis and exposure to the rich culture and history of Polish Jews in the case of the trips to Poland. But can you believe this? There's no mention of Pauline Museum. And many of these, and for the most part, these itineraries don't include Pauline Museum, which is the perfect opportunity. So, you know, you, you know, build it and they will come. Well, apparently not all of them will come. And so I think that it may have to do with, um, let me put it this way. The good news is that in these periods of crisis, particularly now, uh, Jewish museums can bring greater visibility to themselves and to their relevance. I mean, that in essence is what the, the uh, National Jewish Museum of American Jewish History is saying um, in their uh, comment that perhaps the war in the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and, and the rise of anti-Semitism could create more interest in Jewish heritage. That's as, so the question is, can, can we actually, um, in a way, turn this juggernaut around so that now that we've got your attention, the public, uh, there's, we have more to offer you than the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And that, that I think is, I would say it's not only the challenge, it's the opportunity uh, because we have their attention. Uh, but I think, but, but also there's more to it. And that is that the power of, uh, of the story of Holocaust and the urgency of the rise of anti-Semitism, in a sense um, are really difficult to uh, balance with the very rich and deep story of the history of European Jews and their culture. It's, uh, it's a very, very difficult, um, it's very, very difficult to balance the two. So I don't know, I mean, perhaps others have some thoughts on their ways in which they've been trying to address this. Is there anyone in the audience who can solve this issue in a minute? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we should continue. This is actually a good topic, Barbara, for a next uh, for a next meeting. How do we balance this, and, and what do we do with this? Uh, I thank you very much, Barbara. On behalf of all of us, and um, I'm sorry for the short interruption, but it was a perfect presentation afterwards, and it started off so wonderfully already. So, thank you very much for always being around. And thank you. And to the audience, I can say that we now have a shift of faces, which is good, and a shift of people, and we'll, uh, it's, not, it's not a break. We'll just have another group of people on the stage, and then the break is after this. But if you feel that you need water now, go there. Yeah. It's, it's up there.
Now we begin with the plenary. Thank you. Hello. Is this working? Yes? Wonderful. As you can see, I am not Miriam, who was supposed to be chairing this session. My name is Risa Greenberg. You may have thought you were getting Risa Greenblatt when Emil mentioned it earlier, but no. And as you can see, our numbers are greatly reduced from the initial program. Two others from our group have been sidelined because of COVID. Nonetheless, we will probably have an excellent discussion that will continue many of the themes introduced by Miriam, by Emil, and by Barbara, with a focus on museums and communities. Our panelists today are Barbara Stadlinger, who is the director designate of the Vienna Jewish Museum, and Zygmunt Stepinski, who is the director of Polin Museum of History of the Polish Jews. So we heard a lot of references to museums and communities in the previous presentations and remarks, and in particular in reference to issues of crisis, both with reference to COVID and to uh, Ukraine. What we will be doing as a format is to follow what Miriam had outlined to our panelists. Each will give us a five minute presentation and then we will engage in a discussion amongst ourselves and open it up to the floor after that. So, if you will, Barbara, I'm going to ask you to start. Okay. Thank you. I have to say, uh, Miriam um, wrote us so many questions so to prepare. I just took some of them. Um, so maybe we can discuss the rest of the questions later. Um, first of all, thank you, um, Jewish Museum Frankfurt and Miriam. Um, and the AGM for inviting me to this round table. I have to admit, I'm a, in a kind of strange position here. Um, as a former director of the Jewish Museum Augsburg-Schwaben and the future director of the Jewish Museum Vienna, I start on July 1st. So what I'm going to say relates in a way to two museums. My experience at the Jewish Museum Augsburg and my current impression, but also my plans and my hopes for the Jewish Museum Vienna. I hope this is not too confusing for you. Museums have changed a lot in the recent years and decades, and not just since the corona pandemic. In the course of debates on racism and decolonization, the question has been raised to whom, as to whom museums are there for in the first place and to which target group their work should therefore be directed. For many years, in Europe, I think, mostly in Europe, Jewish museums have mostly bypassed local Jewish communities, but now they are rediscovering them as audiences, as an important cooperation partner, and a stakeholder. Our Jewish museum, our Jewish museums therefore slowly becoming community museums, or should they become more like community museums? In Augsburg, the Jewish Museum is situated in the synagogue, synagogue of the Jewish community. This already brings about an intensive interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. And in view of the rising antisemitism, the corona pandemic and the Ukraine war, um, and the resulting conflicts in the Jewish community, one cannot and does not want to make a museum program that has nothing to do with the problems and the needs of the Jewish community. 
In Augsburg, therefore, the Jewish community has become more of an active partner than just an audience. This does not mean that the Jewish community determines the exhibition program or decides on the contents of the exhibitions, but it means that the Jewish community sees the museum's efforts to improve their situation or to create understanding in the local society for the situation of the Jewish community and the Jewish community responds to it. In Vienna, the Jewish community is engaged in the Jewish Museum in a very different ways. As a stakeholder, as a cooperation partner and as an audience, the relationship between the Jewish community and the museum was once better than it is today. And in view of the Jewish community's rich cultural offerings and the close proximity to the museum, it would be a mistake for me not to reconnect the Jewish, the Jewish community with the museum as a cooperation partner. The Jewish community of Vienna, for example, is currently helping about um, thousand people who have fled the Ukraine. For me, it is a matter of course that the Jewish Museum su supports the Jewish community in this, as well as in the fight against anti-Semitism. However, despite the importance of the Jewish community for Jewish museums, Jewish museums are mostly, as in Vienna, for example, municipal museums. And for this reason, they are also committed to the urban community. It means not only that exhibitions have to be understandable and interesting for a non-Jewish audience, but also that Jewish museums have the obligation to reach out uh, to those parts of the urban population um, that, for various reasons, do not go to a Jewish museum. For me, and I think I've shown this in Augsburg, this means going into the public space, going into the schools and going into the districts whose residents do not normally go to the museum. In the end, the entire urban society, urban society should have the opportunity to learn about the contents of the Jewish museum. This is of course a wish, but I think that if you want a wish come true, you have to work on it. Another important group of visitors is the international audience. In Vienna, the number of tourists visit visiting the Jewish Museum is, of course, very much larger than in Augsburg. Yet here, too, we experienced during the corona pandemic that online content of even a small Jewish Museum can generate international interest. The online content of all museums increased rapidly during the pandemic. I've observed for myself that the online audience is uh, first more international and second tends to be younger than the museum audience. Like all museums of cultural history, Jewish museums are confronted with a visitor structure um, that is very dense in the sector of young people due to school classes, and then again um, with people over 40. Between 19 and 40, few people go to museums of cultural history. By the way, this is not because people of this age don't go to museums at all or are not interested in culture at all, um, but there are rather art museums of interest than cultural museums. Um, the corona pandemic and the increased efforts on the, of the online editorial departments of Jewish museums have shown that precisely this population group can also be interested in the content of Jewish museums. And I think, and I will stop here, that we, if we want to retain this group as online or offline visitors of the Jewish museums, we have to make an effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. It's okay? Okay. 
So I think that um, I'm a little bit different from most of the people, museologists, who are gathered today in this conference. I'm a historian, but I never work even one day as a historian. I was a publisher, a worker. I was, uh, I was doing many, many jobs, developer. I was running the publishing house. And uh, 10 years ago, I got a proposal to join the, the staff of the Poland Museum because of my uh, business experience that uh, I was ready to run a very complicated project. Then it happened that uh, Professor Stola didn't receive the appointment from the Polish uh, Minister of Culture. And uh, uh, the Jewish community suggested that I should be the director and to replace Professor Stola. Uh, OK. Uh, so, um, in some cases, I, I have a completely different point of view as a people who are working for museum, but about it a little bit later. So Miriam prepared a, a list of, uh, of questions, and I will try to answer them. The first one, for whom do we work? So the simplest answer is we do our job for the audience, generally for the audience. Our mission goes, we preserve and recall the memory of the history of Polish Jews. We counteract anti-Semitism, discrimination, and exclusion by fostering mutual understanding and respect. Each and every activity that we undertake aims at fulfilling this mission. Looking at the current situation in Poland and globally, we understand that reaching out to the young audience is absolutely key. Our online education program adapted to the condition imposed on us by the pandemic reaches tens of thousands of young people in the most remote corners of Poland who haven't had the opportunity to visit our current exhibition in person. And this is very important because those kids and the parents they do not have enough money to cover the cost of traveling to, to Warsaw for one or two days. So we are reaching them online with great success. The surveys confirm that our education program contributes to a change in attitude among young people. This is the situation we were dreaming for. To bring about the change is the essence of our work. The next Miriam question, vital communities. OK, the Jewish community in Poland uh, residents, uh, well, first, the Jewish community in Poland. Second, the residents of the district erected after the Second World War in the former area, area of the Warsaw Ghetto, which had been raised to the ground. Third, the activists working toward preserving the memory of the local Jewish communities. The police, don't be astonished, but the police is very important. A group, not a community, but a group. And in the past uh, few months, uh, the Ukrainian community in Warsaw. Uh, for me, uh, the audience and communities are two separate groups. Prior to the COVID pandemic, Poland Museum audience totaled over uh, 600,000 people, 600,000 people visiting our exhibition and participating in museum programs. Back then, there was no online events. I mean, concert, conferences, lectures, workshop, and museum lessons. The communities I have listed above are rather small. And yet, we have developed special programs tailored specif specifically for each one, for each and one of them. Uh, the next Miriam question, building relation with the communities. Uh, we consistently pursue our mission. Respect, credibility, and courage are especially important to us. I'd like to think that it is how we are perceived. 
We raise difficult issues and present them honestly and fairly, thus gaining trust among our audience. We often publicly ex express our stance on example, anti-Semitic behavior. Anti-Semitism is rising in Poland, is doing very well with some kind of support from the government. Uh, and we decided that we should do something to react. Uh, maybe I will have an opportunity to tell more about this problem. Uh, and last but not least, we are fairly good in the area of communication. This is why we can reach such an enormous group of people uh, very effectively. Uh, Pauline, the next Miriam question, Pauline versus Jewish community. Uh, to cut the long story short, Pauline Museum is about the Jews and for the Jews. Uh, we collaborate with numerous organizations and indiv in individuals, and the uh, Pauline Museum is a place where the voice can be heard, a loud voice. The exhibition, for example, the exhibition Strange, March 68 and its aftermath, is a good example. It was viewed by almost 120,000 people for the, 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 the frequency for Jewish Museum is on the, above our imagination. We never planned that the, we will reach such a great frequency. And of course, this is an absolute record in Poland. It presented stories told by both the Jews who left Poland, who were forced to left Poland in 68, and those who decided to stay. Uh, several months ago, we produced a documentary titled Proof of Identity, directed by Mikołaj Greenberg. He's a very well-known Polish writer. And uh, in this film, a dozen people from all across Poland, people from the Jewish community, people of different ages and from different backgrounds, talk openly about discovering their Jewish roots, about their Jewish traumas and dilemmas. And uh, I think that me and my team will be most happy to screen the film in other museum as we think it may contribute to generating vital discussion. It's really very interesting, and uh, we jump to this uh, to the conclusion that we show uh, that we should show this film here. It was too late to change plans, but uh, anyway, please contact me or one of my staffers, and we'll help to arrange the screening of this film in your museum. It's absolutely interesting. The next Miriam question, the pandemic. Ah, I will repeat once again, the next Miriam question, the pandemic. Uh, we did all in our might not to lose touch with our audience. Several weeks after the pandemic broke out and the museum closed down for many months, we transferred almost entire program online in order, in order to be able to reach thousands of Poles who themselves were isolated and longing for a prom prompt return to normal. And we also reached the Jewish diaspora and the Israeli. We made them aware of our existence and of the work we do. So it was also a very uh, a strong communication challenge because like other museum and other institutions, we were not prepared to switch activity and program projects uh, from, uh, to online, but we did it. We even start with uh, Pauline Radio. It was operating for one year, uh, and I think that it was the only museum radio in the world. Finally, we jumped to the conclusion that this is too expensive to continue, so um, we withdraw from this, uh, decide to withdraw from this project. 
Uh, the pandemic was a very difficult time, testing and full of stress. And yet it helped us build a supporting and closely knit team. While it taught us how to work remotely, remotely, it also proved that some tasks are best carried out on site when they meet and, communi and communicate in person. But our team is a micro community too, with spe specific needs and expectations from another, from one, from one another, from ourselves, and from the institution as an employer. I'm not going to lie, there was a moment when it was really taught, when he had to cut down salaries, albeit not for a long time. But we were in this process together. Those whose remuneration is highest took the hardest blow. Nobody rebels against it, but we were exceptionally mature about it. Our staff took over the job of, main, of maining the ticket desk and exhibition for almost two years, as we would not afford to employ ex an external company to do the job. And even if we found the job tedious, each and every one of us, myself included, bravely perform these additional duties for eight hours per month. So we survive, and today we, stay, we stand taller, taller uh, than before the pandemic, for such experience only make us stronger. We have a truly exceptional team. Thank you. Thank you both. As you heard, there are many parallels. Certainly, with reference to what you both referred to as serving the Jewish community, I'd like to begin there, because what I heard, particularly from Sigmund, but also from you, Barbara, is that there is more than one Jewish community, or there are different types of Jewish communities. And how do your museums, or how will your museum, attempt to address this? Maybe we start with you. Um, yes, in Vienna there are several Jewish communities. It's a little bit different than in Augsburg. Augsburg, the Jewish community is not so small, but it's um, one big community with um, with problems themselves, yes. Um, yeah, but that's the question. Yeah, we, 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 we will come to that, I'm sure. Um, but in Vienna, um, I hope very much, um, it, now the Jewish, the Jewish Museum Vienna represents more or less um, the um, formal Jewish community in Vienna, the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, but, but not so much um, Jewish minorities or um, the liberal um, community. Um, and I think um, most important is um, to open the house and the minds to get them included and to hear their voices without rejecting um, the other ones just to open the museums up for me is, um, and well, some of you might, might say, well, um, Barbara Staudinger wants to make a communi community museum of the, out of the Jewish museum. Um, I think no, but I think um, the times of um, having a museum, um, which is a house and people come and there is a community which doesn't interest me so much, um, so um, I, I do my own thing and, and they're they are here or not, so I don't care so much. Um, those times are past and those times are past 20 years or 30 years ago, but we have to realize it now, um, otherwise we won't be relevant anymore. Um, and this, um, is for the Jewish community as well as for the urban society. Um, 
if we are um, in um, in terms of thinking um, what what is museum um, as museums of um, yeah of the old museum definition of the icon, I think um, then museum is dead. But if you want to. Um, and we want to be relevant. We want to keep museums alive. And I think that museums have um, a very strong um, um, offer to the society. Um, then we have to work and we have to do, um, we have to change it. So one of the things that I think is really important that with regards to the notion of mu the relationships between museums and communities is the actual architecture of the museum. This comes back to a question that Shelley Hornstein raised with Barbara. We are sitting in the new building of the Frankfurt Jewish Museum. And if you analyze the architecture this new building could be described as a, mu a building for the community. It contains the auditorium that we are sitting in, a large reception hall, the bookstore, the library and archives, the deli, the deli exactly, and the changing exhibitions. Built into this architecture is essentially a museum for the local community who will probably visit the permanent exhibition once and only once and will never have to go back into the Palais Rothschild again, whereas the tourists, that's where they will go and see the whole history and the collections. But I think that what we're seeing here is built into the architecture and the conception of the museum a greater emphasis on programming. The Jewish Museum in Vienna is in a smaller space, and although it was re reorganized relatively recently, what has happened is when you come into that museum, the first thing you encounter is the restaurant, and yes, the permanent display begins on the ground floor, but it begins in a space that is easily converted for social occasions and as an auditorium. And Polin, a new build, was, in my opinion, also built as a community space, a space that is architecturally open in terms of its wall structure, and also contains on its main floor, as you come in, temporary exhibition space, the restaurant. Yes, you do see part of the synagogue reconstruction. There are the education rooms there as well. I think what we're encountering in new Jewish Museum architecture and in revisions of old Jewish Museum architecture, building in this notion of a more open, a more fluid, a more diverse possibility of different forms of interactions with different communities. So I guess I have to ask you this and your response to this, Barbara, as well. Uh, you know, I was publishing a uh, uh, B2B magazine about architecture. And when I joined the team of Pauline Museum, I was very proud that I will start to work with such a beautiful, extremely modern, uh, and absolutely fantastic building. 10 years later, when I'm on the position of the director of the museum, I see a lot of mistakes which was done during the design process uh, with exclusion of, uh, of the experienced museologist who didn't have a chance to express their experience 
their proposals, etc., etc. And uh, right now we are working on the great project Museum 2.0 because we discovered that there are some spaces in the museum which are completely useless. The location of some galleries is in a corner of the museum, so nobody is trying to reach this very interesting exhibition. The shop is also hidden. hidden. It should be relocated to another location. And uh, uh, we should also make some changes in the place when we welcome our guest. So step by step, we are working uh, on the plan of, uh, of changes. Uh, we will need enormous amount of money. So that's fine that the director is not a historian, but is experienced manager who know how to deal with such a challenge. Anyway, the, bu the, the museum is fantastic. And the first reaction of the people is, wow. But then there is some kind of respect. Also in the Jewish community. Uh, my Jewish friends who were who are coming for the first time to the museum, they were in some kind afraid of the prestige of this place. And they uh, couldn't uh, imagine how we'll develop the program, not the exhibition program, the core exhibition, but what kind of events we'll prepare, and if some of them will be devoted only to the Jewish community in Warsaw or in Poland. The community is very small. Please don't ask me how many Jews are in Poland, because this is the first question we never answer. Uh, anyway, uh, we tried to keep a very good relation with Jewish organization. First of all, Professor Stola uh, decided to, 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 to call the, to, to, to make a special, uh, a special committee. And he invited the, 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 the chairman, president, and so on of the leading Jewish organization in Poland, just to have a forum for open discussion about museum problems, about the problems of the community. Uh, and um, it was a fantastic idea, but um, you know, I don't know how it is in Germany, in Frankfurt, or in Vienna, but the uh, Jewish community in Poland, there are few groups which are fighting with them. They are the court Jews which support the government. Doesn't matter if it is a right wing government or the left wing government. Uh, there are groups who are a little bit isolated. I meet the religious Jews who are members of the Jewish community. They attend the, 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 the prayers in the in synagogue and many, many, many others. So uh, we cooperate with the Jewish, uh, Jewish theater in Warsaw. We cooperate with Bnei Brit. I'm the member of the Bnei Brit. Uh, with some NGOs who was founded uh, by Jewish people, and they have the same idea exactly as the museum, so it's even easier to, co to cooperate with them. And right now, when we uh, are working on the, uh, on the very serious project uh, combating anti-Semitism in Poland, of course, we cooperate with several Jewish organizations because um, we we would like to know the, the, the opinion of the represent, representatives of the community, not only about the, the program, but also to participate in it and to, to, to make some interview with them. Uh, because in my opinion and the team opinion, it will only reinforce the, the, the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I will... Um, trying to concentrate my, my answer on the architecture. Um, you know, my, I was in London once and I, was to the, uh, I went to the Tate Modern and I was totally impressed the first time I saw the Tate Modern. You can just go through, the ground floor is um, totally free, it's with art, artwork, um, it's, um, it's a wonderful place and it's not a museum like a, like the Pauline, everybody is impressed, 
but um, when it's, if it's raining, and it's, it is raining in London, um, people go with their strollers, um, just um, passing the museum, just waiting if it stops to, to rain. Um, they're, they're chatting, they're, yeah, they're enjoying life. And if you ask me um, what um, architecture for a um, museum, which is for the community, which be, would be the best, I would say, yes, this. Um, but the Jewish Museum Vienna is located in two historical buildings. Um, so there is, nothing, um, there, there is nothing you can do to make it like a Tate Modern, um, except building a new museum. Um, but, um, yes, something is done. For example, you mentioned it, uh, the first, first thing when you enter the museum um, is uh, that you see the cafe. And um, I think, for me, this is, this is very important because um, it's, um, it's easier to enter, first a museum, second a Jewish museum, if you just go into a cafe, cafe. they serve quite nice food, they have um, a little, um, I forgot the, the, the English word, uh, a little Gastgarten, a little place outside where you can sit and, and, and eat your meal um, or drink a coffee. So um, this is nice, it's a nice place. Um, and I think um, people who pass by, they, they ca just can go in there without buying a ticket, without looking at a museum. And I think this, um, yes, this is important for, for a museum who wants to be um, connected to the community. And then it's, it's important that you, that you go on the ground floor and you see something. It's not just um, an entrance and um, a shop, but you see something. So we've been talking about how the actual physical space of a museum, a Jewish museum, can open itself more to different types of communities and, in a sense, create a welcoming atmosphere. You do have problems in Vienna, yes, because you are in traditional buildings. However, both of you have mentioned how important increased digital programming, in other words, going online as well as being on site, were to reaching different communities. Uh, perhaps you could talk more specifically about what you did online, Barbara. Uh, we did hear from Siegmund. Uh, we did different things. Um, first of all, that what, what all museums did, like online exhibition openings, which is um, yeah, a sad story. <laughs> I hate online exhibitions. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a people person. Um, but we did podcasts. And these podcasts are, this is a new opportunity. Um, for me, it was, it was um, interesting that so many young people, uh, it was a podcast on the, um, on the um, exhibition um, uh, um, Shalom Sisters, um, Shalom, yeah, Shalom Sisters, um, uh, but, and it was, the, the title was Let's Talk Sisters, and it was, yeah, one talk was with uh, Sarah Susan, uh, Sassoon. Um, it was, yeah, it was interesting, and many people were interested in these talks about being a Jewish woman, um, living and everyday life, um, about Israel, about many topics. Um, and I thought, yes, this could be a nice opportunity. This was the first thing. The second thing is what... Um, what I think was um, a good idea, 
is to increase the um, social media accounts, um, to make short stories um, on Jewish heroines um, on Instagram, or to um, make short, very, very short films, um, educational films on Instagram. Um, so, because the online audience, we, there are so many museums, there are so many topics, there are so many different um, styles. But if you create something um, like with an effort and with, uh, with passion, people would, it would reach people and people would, would respond to it. One of the things that you both mentioned was the difficulty of reaching a particular age demographic, younger people, and involving them. And in a sense, this is what you're uh, alluding to when you're referring to the podcasts. We do not have such a problem. You don't? No, absolutely. We can reach thousands and thousands of young people um, online or... Uh, in a museum, day by day, we have 30 buses with school groups, yeah. which... Despite school groups. Despite school groups? Yeah, no... Okay, we organize... 19 to, okay, to, but, to uh, 35, First 40. of all, it's not a piece of cake to bring the, the, the school groups to the museum, because, as Barbara mentioned, uh, the Pauline Museum is not on the list of the museum recommended by the Minister of Culture, and minister, not culture, but the Minister of Education. So it's a great work for us to reach thousands and thousands of teachers all around the country and to convince them that in our museum uh, they will get something they will not get in any other place. And uh, uh, if I had the time, I will quote some. Uh, I will quote some numbers. Uh, in two years, um, over fifty thousand children—not high, high school students, but also pupils from the seven, eight years old—participated in three thousand uh, classes online and online and offline. And what is most, most important, 98% of teachers are satisfied with the participation in Pauline online classes. 93% of teachers, participants of the program, declared that the knowledge on the history and culture of Polish Jews have broadened. And what is most important, 23% of teachers surveyed by the museum had never used any museum education offer for schools. So we are very effective, but you know, um, the Wutsiakov staff, uh, staff, most of them knew Wutsiakov, she's the head of the, of the education department. This is, uh, it was an enormous difficult task to, to prepare the program which will attract teachers and then attract the children and also make some changes, you know, in children's head. This is the target, to, to, to change something in this country like Poland. One of the great difficulties for young people to go to museums, certainly in North America, is the cost. In other words, it's one thing to be taken as part of a group and a school group, and you go and you have your visit, and then there's the possibility of online educational programs as well. But to actually go back to the museum on your own, on a more regular basis, often involves money. I was brought up in Ottawa, and the National Gallery was free when I was a teenager. And where did I go? Sometimes after I went to synagogue on Saturday morning, more often I didn't go to synagogue on Saturday morning, I went to the gallery because 
I could. I could just walk in and I didn't have to pay anything. I hear time and time again that youth do not do this because they will not spend the money or they, more importantly, they do not have the money. And in addition to the crises that were mentioned, COVID and Ukraine, we all know that we are entering a major economic crisis related to both of these events. So I guess my question is now about how the financial crisis, which we are just beginning to enter, is going to further affect Jewish museums, and most importantly, how Jewish museums are going to be able to involve communities who do not have the financial means to engage with Jewish museums. Well, uh, we are the beneficiary of the, uh, of the program uh, established by the Minister of Culture, uh, the visit to Museum for One Zlatan. Uh, so, each class, they pair, they pair one zloty for each person. And then we put in a report to the Minister of Culture and we receive full gratification for the expenses and all expenses are covered by the Minister of Culture first. The admission for Ukrainian is free. Uh, one day, the entrance to the museum is free. It's Saturday, so a large group of people, are also young people with families, are coming to the museum on Thursday. Every week. Every week. Bravo. Bravo. But we have to adapt, to adjust to the Polish law. Uh, anyway, I think that, um, of course, uh, to bring one person once time to the museum is not a success. Exactly. To make him to come back, it's a great success. So we are working on our program to be so attractive uh, that the people who were visiting uh, the museum a year ago, two years ago, will come for another temporary exhibition for one of our concerts, because for years we are organizing uh, uh, a concert in, 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 in museum. And first of all, uh, we start for very young children who, was, who were just born. The parents can come to the museum with a two weeks, one month old child. And uh, we have a special program because usually they, they come with an older, uh, older brother or sister. And we run a special program uh, and it's so popular uh, among among parents that if we had money, we could we should build another room for for families and for kids. And this is the way we build the future visitors of the museum. And we teach them, you know, the Jewish culture. We start from the alphabet and we some games, some plays. We have uh, fantastic educators, and the kids are dreaming about return to the same place once again. So um, it was a long discussion because we devote to this space for children after you know the, the battle between the former director of the museum and the staff of the education department. Finally, thanks God, the education department won the battle. And we have a fantastic place for the families, for kids. And I believe that they will be returning to the museum when they will grow up. Let us hope. Can you speak a bit about how you see possible financial implications? Mm -hmm. um, right now, the Wien Museum, the Historical Museum of Vienna, is um, being rebuilt, and they will be uh, free of charge for every person because um, they say well, the history of Vienna must be free for Viennese people because it's their history. They have the right to see it. It's, it's their history. So uh, in this light, yes, we have to think about it to make the permanent exhibition for free. Um, but that's not my decision. Um, 
but I will like drop it somewhere. Um, this is the first point. The second point, yeah, there are groups um, in, within the population that cannot afford to go to the Jewish Museum. Uh, maybe within a school class, but not on their own. Um, they just cannot afford it. That's why I think um, it's most necessary that the Jewish Museum um, comes to them, uh, make uh, like events or pop-up museums or um, education programs in um, the outer districts or in, um, in schools, um, not just to bring the school classes to the Jewish Museum. Because there's a second reason why children don't come to, to Jewish museums, they don't come because their parents say, well, it's a Holocaust museum. I don't want to see my child um, confronted with the Holocaust in the age of seven. And there is nothing I can say to them uh, which convinces them that this is not a Holocaust museum. Um, or they have um, stereotypes uh, that prejudices towards the Jewish community or towards Jews. Um, so they won't come. But if you, um, if you go to the school class, um, they, they would be there. And you make a program like, um, as we did in the beginning of the COVID pan uh, pandemic, like, OK, um, Pesach is about eating feelings. So what? Um, was with a, with a eight year old children. So how tastes joy? What do you think? And then the children say many things, but they say um, even unexpected things. And I remember very, very much a boy who said, joy um, tastes like orange, an orange. Mm -hmm. And all the children said, okay, yes, yes, I got you. That's the point. Orange is joy. So we, we ate a plate with orange and with pickles and with all the feelings the children decided. So maybe, and of maybe they didn't know after this lesson what, um, what Pesach means, but um, they went home and they told their parents, um, hey, the Jewish Museum was today in class and we ate feelings. And they told them, well, um, in other religions, it's similar. They are, uh, yeah. Um, so, and then um, at the next event at the Jewish Museum for, for Children, they came. Okay. So um, I think um, most important is not to wait or to complain or that people can afford or don't come because, because of prejudices, but to, to make an effort to come to them, to, um, to have a nice experience, an experience, a nice experience with the Jewish Museum, and then they will come back. I've just realized the time. We are sorry? Well, no, not at all. What I was about to say was certainly what has been very clear is with regard to both of your museums, you have risen to the challenge of the recent crises, in particular by your reaching out in so many different kinds of ways to so many different communities and the communities within those communities to expand your audiences, both on site and online, both within the walls of the museums and outside the walls of the museums. You've redefined what outreach is and also what inreach is. So uh, forgive me, I'm a very bad moderator. No time for questions, except during the break. <laughs>
Hello, Ms. Yamchuk, are you here? Do you hear me? This is Sasha from Technical Support.
It's on? It works? Can you hear me? Hi, welcome all who are already here. We will begin in two minutes. Have your seats. We will begin in one minute. Discipline ourselves. Um, so I have one, one short amount of announcement before we begin with the next plenary session, which is uh, that those of you who have not signed up for tonight's dinner cannot join us for tonight's dinner. So the, tonight's the, the dinner party is only for those who, uh, because of the, I, I can't help it, don't shoot the messenger. And um, you know that you can either walk or go by, uh, by metro. For those of you who want to go on themselves, um, for those of you who want to go by themselves, the address is at, in the back of the board. I was going to say whiteboard, but it's actually a silver board. It's on the board at, in back of the room. And uh, so you can write down the address. So three options to get there, uh, provided you have realized in advance that you want to join us. And if not, this is a big city, I'm sorry. They, um, <laughs> and you will have a wonderful night as well. So the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's our last session, but I think it goes uh, as the real important one. And I hope you also had some thoughts while listening to Barbara and Zygmunt and Barbara. Uh, and we can think not only about uh, the atrocities of war uh, in Ukraine, but also about the impact for our colleagues in Ukraine's museums. M my name is Joanna Fikus. I'm representing Pauline Museum. And with me, uh, I have two guests. It's uh, Anna Yamchuk, I'm not sure if you can see, yeah. This is Anna Yamchuk, she's our colleague from the Chernivtsi Museum of the History and Culture of Bukovinian Jews, and also uh, Jakub Nowakowski from uh, Galicia Jewish Museums. Uh, I have to say that uh, while listening to Barbara, I was thinking about the definition of museum that she was mentioning. And uh, she says that there were some discussions and debates. Hi, guys. Thank you. Uh, so there were some debates. Uh, what should the museum be? Uh, and I wrote it down that there were uh, debates if the museum should be kind of polyphonic spaces uh, and that, in fact, they should acknowledge and address 
uh, conflicts and challenges of the present. So I think it's a, a kind of the very, very good yet painful introduction to our uh, today's session and meeting with uh, Anna and with Kuba. Uh, Anna is in Ukraine and she will tell us in a moment about her situation. Kuba from Galicia Museum in Krakow is very much involved uh, as a representative of this institution in helping Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Uh, I think that maybe uh, I would like to begin with asking you, Anna, I'm sorry, I'm looking down, but I see her here. Uh, so I would like to ask you, Anna, tell me, um, what was the community of your museum before the war? Please turn off I your see, mic. I see. I yeah. see. Hi, yeah. everyone again. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, I would like to say uh, great to be with you, but I cannot say it right now. Honestly, I wish so much I, I could be there and talk to you in about different topics today. While answering your question, I have to say, first of all, that I don't know how many of you have been to Chernivtsi, or maybe, uh, but Chernivtsi is, a, it's not a big city. It, it, let's say it's, it's a town, so where you also always know someone who knows someone who knows you. So it is very closed. It is very tight community. That is, it means that in this in this way you are uh, wanted or not, you are strongly bond with your surroundings. And for our museum, our very tiny museum, I have to admit, but still, uh, from the very beginning of our work, we wanted to be as much engaged with our uh, with our inhabitants and with our visitors as it is possible. So besides of doing excursions in the museum, we've been vitally engaged in different projects, especially with school kids, with um, topics like human rights, with topics like um, uh, history of our city. And that is why I would say that I want to believe that we had I hope we still have our place in our community. So we wanted to be educators, let's say. And uh, we, we did what we could for that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us broadly where you are now and are you safe? Uh, I cannot say that I am safe because I don't believe there is a place in Ukraine right now where you can say that you are safe. But I'm still here. Uh, when the war started, uh, my um, younger child was only four months old. I could not imagine traveling somewhere abroad, especially uh, since um, at the beginning of the war, uh, lines at the border where it, it took up to three or four days waiting in the line to cross the border. I, I, I could not imagine it do it with such a small kid. So what my instincts, my motherly instincts made me do is just live in the city because still uh, Chernivtsi is a center of the oblast. So while it is small, it is still a target for missile attack. And we had, uh, before I left the city, we had already a few uh, air raid uh, warnings in the middle of the night. And I cannot explain you, and I, I, I don't want any of you to feel what it is like to wake up in the middle of the night uh, holding your kid when it's still February and you don't know where you should run, whether you should hide in a basement, uh, whether you should risk him being getting sick because it's cold there or whether you should be worried about uh, having your building uh, set on fire because of the bombs because you don't know where the missile would uh, hit so after this shock after consideration i just decided to move uh, to my pa parents who live in a village hopefully it's i i hope it's a bit safer here. As for our museum, it is uh, closed. It is uh, right now, it's not working, not only because of the war, but honestly, um, we've been, we've had some problems even before that because 
ever since the COVID hit the city. Uh, our museum is a non-governmental museum, which highly depends on um, uh, supporting support from its sponsors and uh, visitors got uh, into a difficult financial situation because neither for sponsors, neither for visitors, it was up to the museums in, in the first year of this pandemic. So we've been working on like project related basis. We uh, been working mostly from home and opened the museum only when uh, we had um, uh, orders for excursions for guided tours. Uh, obviously, with the beginning of the war, it got even more difficult. Uh, at first, I believe most of the museums got closed for a few days because it was it was just a terrible shock for everyone. No one would saw that in the 21st century, it's so easy just to attack a neighboring country and nobody believed it would really happen. Uh, as far as I, as, as I know, state museums in uh, cities where it is relatively safe are open right now but uh, our museum as i mentioned is closed we we are working from home what we can do from home thank you and um kuba uh, since as i've said i know that your museum is very much involved in um, helping refugees uh, what were your first thoughts on, on, on this day, February 24th, when the war broke out. It was so close to our, to our borders. Um, well, yes, um, for us, I mean, as, as for probably most of us, with exception of those that are in Ukraine, this was for the first hours just a, a news on, on the mobile phone. I mean, we woke up and we have all read messages. Um, but for us, it got real very quickly because at the museum, uh, we already had um, four workers from Ukraine. Some of you may know that over the last two years, there was a more than one million economical immigrants from Ukraine that came to Poland to work. That was before the war broke out. So um, at the museum at the time, the, the, the February 24th, we already had four people working from Ukraine. And when we show up at work, for us, we could see that this is real. I mean, we've seen those people in tears uh, shake, shaken up on the phone uh, because this was really happening to their families, to their friends back in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And it was a shock also for us because um, you know, the, the discussions, I mean, for us, the situation is obvious. Are you safe? One of the first questions Jana uh, asked, are you safe? They were safe here. Uh, one of our colleagues um, who actually two days before the war broke out got his working permit extended for two years um, showed up to my office, and that's again day one. Uh, and he said, listen, I need to go back to Ukraine. And that's not something one would think can happen. I mean, are you safe? You're safe here. And yet this, this pretty young uh, mid-20s uh, boy decided that he wants to go back to Ukraine to fight. And he had no, his entire family, mother, father, uncles, they were all in Poland. So there is no one that you need to get out from, from, the, from the war zone. And he's the only son. I mean, it can, couldn't be more, more, more po you know, poetic in a sense. He's the only son. He goes, he finishes his shift at work, and he, his buddies are, are picking him up. And he calls his mother from the border at the middle of the night to, to tell her that he's not coming back. I mean, these are stories that we know from the history, how the young boys been doing. Um, so for us, it really got very quickly on day one, because we've seen the people that have been very much affected by, by the war. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, and tell me, because you said that uh, your museum was immediately closed once the war broke out, but can you please tell me, uh, maybe not about uh, you as the, as, the, as the team of museum or your community, but did you have earlier, before the war, any plans of, I don't know, protecting your collection or evacuation of the collection or something like this, or you simply didn't expect it? Honestly, we didn't expect it. We, we, we couldn't imagine it. I still, I still, on the fourth month of this war, I still find it difficult to believe that it is happening. One day I just, I, and that was not just for me, that was for the entire, like, we have a very small team of the museum, but for everyone, it was, at first it was 
we were shocked and obviously thinking of our families. Second of all, our director um, made a plan like when after the war broke up on the first days, like what should be done where we could at least hide some very most precious for us exhibits doing at least what we can do because no one actually taught us what should we do when there are missiles probably landing in your city we that's not what we knew about or how to how to do in this situation so after after the shock passed for for after a few first days our director made this plan what sh should be done in case if we see that if the situation deteriorates and if it gets worse. Luckily, so far, it, 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 we didn't come to this point when we would need to evacuate our collection. We hope it won't go to this point. But if it does, at the moment, we are ready for that. Just briefly, I would like to add to this because uh, I'm thinking also about this day, February 24th in the morning uh, at the Pauline Museum when we gathered together, there was, as you've said, there was a shock, complete shock, and we asked ourselves, what can we do? And the very first thing that we thought, it was simply a gesture. We thought that we should uh, put the Ukrainian flag, uh, uh, blue and yellow, in front of our museum. And I know that many institutions in the very uh, first moment uh, thought about gestures. But then, of course, we were also thinking about um, uh, the way of uh, helping as us individuals, but also as institutions. And I I'd like to ask you, Kuba, because you've done a lot of things. Can you please tell us what Galicia Museum in Krakow is doing? Um, uh, yes, I mean, again, I mean, this all kind of started from from this 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 morning when we see those those friends, and I mean, the same questions. I mean, how can we help? Uh, and but that's not a general question. It's not an act of of support, of theoretical support. This is a very practical question. How can we help? How can we help to your father? How can we help to your, your parents who are in Kiev or in Eastern uh, uh, Ukraine? Um, so so we, we've started to do s s similar things or things that, that, that many other institutions across Poland been started to do at the same time. And that's, uh, Barbara has also mentioned about this uh, very unusual situation when suddenly you know, lots and lots of different NGOs, organizations are trying to collect supplies, food, medicines, and all sorts of different things and ship them all the way um, toward the through the border. So that's, that's one of the things that we've been starting to, we started to do from the day, day one. And again, because of this connection, we were targeting uh, um, um, uh, people that, uh, members of the family, people, uh, one of our uh, employees, uh, her brother is working in a hospital in the city of Fastuf near Kiev. So he would send us uh, um, list of the things that he need. And of course, there was like big university hospital in Krakow that had been collecting medicines and would ship this big shipment to the big hospital in Kiev. But if you're in a small town, you're at the very foot, very end of this food chain. It will take weeks until you get a share of, the, of those big packages that will go to Kiev. So we've been getting those, those messages. We need bandages. And, and you know, there were heartbreaking uh, uh, items on, on this list, like a uh, a vacuum pressure uh, system to for shrapnel and burn wounds for children. When you get this message and you say that they, this is what something that they desperately need, your heart melts. And the problem was that there was no nothing. No, no those items were all sold out already in in, in, the, in the pharmacies in the, in the warehouses. So it was ordering them online from from Czech Republic. Um, so we've been doing that. And again, this was something that was done by many others. So there's the JCC in Krakow, there's JDC, Taubi Foundation, and so on. Um, but at the same time, we, we, we started to think, what, what can we do more beyond that, that this, 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 I don't know, this standard or the first ap approach? And um, we've, uh, we've understand that, um, that there are those refugees flocking in. And, and really, I mean, those uh, uh, three million people uh, that, that Barbara again mentioned, the three million people that came to Poland over the, within the few weeks. For the first time in history, actually, the number of inhabitants of Poland reached 40 millions. This is 38 millions on day one, 
and then 41 million people in, in a few weeks later. In Krakow, the city of, let's say, 900,000 inhabitants, you have suddenly 250,000 inhabitants, uh, new inhabitants, people that are flocking in, women and children, mostly. Um, and it got also for us very personal because we've been, um, with, with my wife and my family, we've been, we started to host those families at home uh, very quickly. So until now, we had like five or six different families uh, coming over through our house. And again, I mean, the first night, that's something that was mentioned. It's the middle of the night, we get a call from, the, from a, a foundation. It's all NGOs uh, that is arranging the, the, uh, the refugees. And they say, listen, there's a family that arrives from somewhere Ukraine. Can you bring them in? So we, we said, well, of course. In the middle of the night, and you have these this two women, two children. One is five, the other one is seven, with a backpack, with a teddy bear. And again, I mean, you start to cry because th those things shouldn't happen anymore. That's why we, you, me, uh, we all do the things that we do. So those things would never happen again. And yet, in the middle of the night, we see those people. So it, again, it got very personal for us. And then we realized that how can we help those people? How can we help beyond opening the doors? Um, so we decided that, I mean, realize that, that they need to do something. I mean, they, they, they are coming in, they are refugees, but they are also professionals. Before coming, before, before, before becoming a stranger on the doorstep to our house, one lady was an English teacher. So we kind of gradually think, what can we do beyond this? And we've um, decided that we will try to find, to, be, to offer them jobs. I mean, we'll try to, to make them uh, not a refugee, but a, but a person with, a, with, a, with an experience, with, 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 you know, who can work, not receive help, but earn money. So um, to make a long story short, over the next uh, uh, two weeks, we've, we've been able to hire eight uh, refugees in different places across the museum. And we're talking here about the museum that on day one had 14 staff members. Adding eight, it's a quite a big change. Um, but also we decided to do programs, uh, concerts, uh, or sorts of different activities. But unlike um, other institutions where we want, we, many of them would do a Polish music concert for the Ukrainians, we've, again, encouraged the Ukrainians musicians, Ukrainians performers, to do the concerts. So it's not we do things for them, we give them tools so they can do things. Um, so they can, again, be, a, be a, a musician, be a performer, be an artist. Um, and we, we keep doing that. I mean, offering tools, giving space for them to do things that they are expert in. Um, uh, we're, and the, the, the flagship project that, that we've, we've done, uh, actually because of the realization that those kids that are at our home, they don't really have anything to do. I'm going to work, my wife is at work, kids are in the kindergarten, and we have those two or three kids staying behind. So we've decided that we have a space, we have a tools at the museum to open a daycare center. So after two weeks of war, we open a daycare center, we turn kind of this kind of space uh, uh, into a daycare center, uh, which is, is hosting uh, at the average between 15 up to 25 kids, Ukrainian kids uh, per day. Uh, it's free of charge, obviously. We're providing food, we're providing meals, we're providing therapy, we provide Polish classes, English classes, dance classes, we take them to, to see different, uh, different uh, you know, museums and so on. If, if you can maybe, uh, if we can see the drawings that those kids uh, presented, it will give you kind of idea of, of, of who, who, they, who those kids are. And again, I mean, it was important for us, yet again, that we will do it all through the hands of the Ukrainians. So we've, we, have, we hired four staff, uh, four teachers, all of them, again, refugees, people that came to Poland with a sack, a back, one bag. We've hired them, so we have four, four full-time teachers uh, running the show. Uh, every single activity that is being done in this, in this daycare center is being done by the refugee themselves. We're paying them, we're allowing them to earn money, we're allowing them to feel better, to be, again, someone, and not a number in the statistic of, of the refugees. So, so, so this has been something that has uh, been ex extremely important for us. And I mean, again, you know, there, there is a question of where does our responsibility end as a museum? I mean, we're donating space, we're providing staff that is taking care of, of helping out, uh, we're organizing a, a tour. It's, it's, it's a march. We had a very nice march in Poland. So we line up those kids and we take them to the, uh, to the um, kinder, um, kindergarten, to the, to, to, you know, outside kindergarten. And we see that it's like 20 degrees outside and all of those kids are in winter boots and winter coats because this is how they left their homes in Ukraine. So where does our responsibility end? We, we go and we buy 55 uh, boxes of shoes. We buy clothes. 
The kid is coming and he has swollen face because his teeth is broken and been broken for two weeks. Where does our responsibility end? So we take her to the dentist. We provide and keep providing things because we don't know if it's, I mean, is that something that we have in an ICOM uh, definition of the museum? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, I don't have this in my job description, neither of my uh, colleagues uh, either, but this is what we can do and this is what we do. So, I mean, um, these are, these were the, would be the main things that we, we keep going, keep, keep uh, kept doing since, since the war broke out. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you hear, as you see what, what, what Jakob is describing, this was really very, very grassroots initiatives of uh, cultural institutions in Poland. Some, some cultural institutions like um, uh, Art Gallery, uh, Biennale in Warsaw, they completely changed into the shelter. Uh, and they, they, they stopped their, their uh, activity as the Art Gallery and they are the shelter. But going back, uh, Anna, to you. Can I ask you, I'm sorry for asking this blunt, very blunt question, but do you get salaries as employees of no. your museums? No, right now we are like kind of officially we are on the non-paid uh, vacation, let's say so. Hmm. Well, uh, but, but you've said that you are non-governmental institution. Yes, our museum is a non-governmental institution. It was founded by a few NGOs. And so as long as it was functioning from the very beginning, our budget consisted like some part coming from sponsors and some part coming from um, visiting from uh, our activities as they were. So as I said, for first the COVID and now the war, neither for sponsors, neither for visitors, it is up to visiting the museum. So that is why uh, we are working on, on, on just on some projects that we still had. And just before the war broke out, we got a very big project. We were supposed, uh, we, were, we were so eager to run. Uh, I, I don't know how it would go now. We are at the moment uh, when everything is more or less calm, we are trying to do some steps forward, but we are not making any big plans at the moment. But, but, but what kind of steps forward are you doing now? I mean, uh, this is a project, um, educational project again, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of them. Uh, they are supposed to, we are supposed to have many workshops with school kids and uh, we are supposed to create learning apps uh, for the museums. So at the moment we can do some digital stuff that we are doing at home, but we cannot plan on um, testing them and having them operational in, in a week or in a month or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe some of you have questions that you would like to ask. Uh, yes, there is a mic here. If you want to ask Anna or Kuba. It's over here. Thank you. Uh, Eva Atlan, Jewish Museum, <laughs> Frankfurt. Um, uh, thank you, both of you, to, to discuss this, this subject here, three of you. Um, I was very impressed by what you did, uh, Jakob, in, um, in Krakow, and I was uh, wondering uh, to, to, to take uh, eight people uh, at, as a staff supplementary, um, how um, is it financed, this, all this, what you did, what you, you recounted? I was just in thinking, how did you get the funds? Um, well, yes, the funds are important. Um, and uh, at the very beginning, I mean, m most of the things that we started to do were done um, without funding. I mean, we've, we've, when we decided that we want to collect funds or collect food and so on, it was, it was people would bring things. People do trust museums, you know, all of, you, you all know about that. So uh, we kind of utilize this fact that people trust the museum. So people were, were keen to bring things for us and of course to take care of that was all done by our staff members and, uh, and we would still be paying them from our, our own pocket. Fortunately, with time, I mean very quickly, there was this, this realization that people wanted to help. That people, we, we are in this position because of pure geography. We are where we are. Lots of people have been contacting us, again, because they trust us. 
uh, asking how can we help. So very quickly, uh, um, the, the funds started to float, float, float in, and, and we've been able to hire those people because of the grants that we received from different uh, uh, European anonymous foundations, uh, um, if you know what I mean, uh, uh, private donors. Um, people have been, been asking, how can we help? You know, can we send... Can we send food, and medicines, and so on, and so on? And we say, well, you know, instead of you paying two hundred fifty dollars for a package that will stuck on the on the customs for two months, and we need to pay uh, uh, to, to pick it up, maybe we can use those two hundred fifty dollars to pay someone for uh, for workshops, for classes. Um, so now most of it uh, um, is is being covered from um, from the donations that we've got from very different people from ar around the world. But, but maybe adding to what Kuba said, each of these organizations, as I told you, had its own way of trying to uh, fundraise money for this fund. So all of us, we began simply by, by our own money or time or whatever we could do. Uh, and then also, as uh, here in case of Pauline, as Barbara mentioned, we, uh, we, used to op we opened the uh, exhibition about the, f the, the Jewish... Uh, Mm, uh, food culture, which seemed to us very odd in this very moment on 24th, on 25th of February to open such, uh, such an exhibition. So we immediately decided that uh, uh, we are going to collect money from our visitors and from us, and this money goes to food uh, and help for people who are in Poland. Because one thing is to help people who are in Ukraine, and the other is how to help people who are here uh, in Poland, and as, as Kuba said, these are mainly women with small children, so not many of them can work, not many of them can earn money, because, uh, as you know very well, men uh, cannot leave Ukraine. And, and that's precisely why we thought that this idea of daycare center, where those women that can't work because they are stuck with their children, will be useful. And this is how, how it works, that those women uh, would bring their kids for eight hours uh, five days a week, so they can sort out documents, they can, you know, do their things or just rest. I mean, it's, it's not about work, it's just resting. If you, I'm sure some of you are parents and being stuck with your four-year-old four son or, or kid may be challenging. Um, so, so just to, that was one of the things that we think that this daycare center really works because it helps on so many different levels. It helps to the children, it helps to the uh, uh, people that are running it, it helps to the parents. Um, mm. Any other questions? No. Yes, please. Uh, I think I guess it's a good follow up um, uh, for the German Jewish museums that are here. The Ernst von Siemens Stiftung uh, funds um, costs for personal for staff members up to 100% depending on how big your institution is. So this, in, this uh, foundation together with other funders helped us to invite two fellows to the Museum of Augsburg. Um, and we are going to open uh, an exhibition on uh, Ukrainian Jewish life in October, which is called Voices, a Mosaic of Ukrainian Jewish Voice. And I'm telling you this also because um, once it has been shown in Augsburg, we would like this uh, exhibition to travel also for fundraising, for um, helping uh, a Ukrainian Jewish museum. So if you're interested, just contact me. And, and I would like to be, actually, if we can get in touch or can fund, a, I don't know, a newsletter group or whatever with everybody hosting Ukrainian um, staff members at their museums, if we can connect, I think that could also help um, us in many respects. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Or if not, Anna, how can we help you? Uh, you and other colleagues, uh, museologists from Ukraine, how do you envision it? It's a very difficult question. I, I, I honestly, I, among all of the questions that you sent me in a letter, we would like you would like to discuss later. That was probably the most difficult one because. Honestly, all we need right now is victory in this war. Everyone, either it is either it is a museum, either it is a school, or just an individual. Nothing can work until it is over because the life completely is on hold for most of us. 
in in different spheres, in different on different levels, I would say everyone is affected differently, and still we uh, we cannot. It's you know. It's a terrible thing when you cannot plan your future. That's uh, that's that's, a, uh, that's very difficult. As for the museum, I I would say that we already have what we needed in um, in terms of uh, uh, supporting our uh, exhibition because um, a few uh, weeks ago, I guess, we've got support from. Uh, I, I hear you've talked about ICOM already, <laughs> but so we got, uh, in a, I would like to add some positive <laughs> words because uh, thanks to this institution, we've got um, uh, necessary equipment for packing and moving our exhibition in case we need that. So not only our museum, uh, our director was contacted from this institution, but he mentioned that we are so tiny, we don't know whether um, it is even worse to, uh, having so much problems with the border customs and so on, but they offered uh, if they could help more. So five museums from Chernivtsi, four uh, governmental museums, uh, four state museums, and one our museum received this necessary support, like stuff for packaging, for, for, uh, for wrapping the exhibits, for moving them. So we have it for now, if in case we would need to hide the exhibition and evacuate it. As for us, as, uh, uh, as museum co-workers, as individuals, I, am, I just want, first of all, to say thank you for everything you've been doing. What I'm hearing from what you are doing in Krakow, I know that also a lot of things are uh, going on in many other cities. I, I've been contacted with many colleagues on the very first day from of this terrible war, and I was I was deeply touched for all the support I've all the words of support I've had heard. Um, I the only thing I would think I would think of maybe association as an institution can maybe write an official letter, I don't know, to European Parliament or so on and so on, so on, like asking for support of Ukraine in this war in, in, in the possible levels. And also I am grateful for what you are doing for Ukrainian refugees because I can imagine how difficult it is for them right now. It is very difficult in here. It is also very difficult out there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, what we were describing, the situation that we were trying to describe to you with uh, Cuba is our activities, um, how to maintain completely new activities for people who are refugees and who don't feel um, safe in Poland. Many of them, and we have encountered it, many of these refugees wanted and want to go back to Ukraine and many of them are coming back there. Uh, so we have to plan our activities uh, for refugees, adjusting it to their needs. And we have to understand that these needs are changing. And uh, usually, as you know all very well, we are planning as museologists our programs for months or years. And here you have to simply adjust and really listen to, to this very specific audience. And I think it's also... Uh, kind of completely different situation to all of us. Do you have any other, do you want to ask anyone? Yes, please. I am Silvio Ovadia from Istanbul, Turkey. I want to ask where a, a Jewish museum organization, if we can uh, make a list of the exhibition of the uh, Jewish Museum from Ukraine, the exhibition list, and we can give money to take the exhibition for a time. It will be the most easy thing. Why, 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 
can you can can you take the mic, please? Because Anna cannot hear you, so yeah. she don't have the mic. In the Ukrainian, there is uh, some simple exhibition about uh, the Judaism in Ukraine that you already experienced something also, panel exhibition that we can host in our museum all together for some weeks, beginning uh, at the end of this summer, or perhaps also before, and together as AJM, everybody host the same exhibition, simple or, or large exhibition, doesn't matter, this depends on the space that uh, everybody has. And uh, I think it is a, a political sign, and also we can ask, for example, one euro more from each visitors come to visit our museums, and uh, of course it's a drop into the sea, but uh, is uh, very, very important as a sign. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is something that we were all mentioning, and I think Barbara was mentioning, mentioning about it. How, what we as the Jewish Museum, how can we put this Jewish lens into this uh, uh, current situation? Or simply, in a very practical point of view, I think all of us, since we are here, we can contact each other, uh, we can contact Anna or other colleagues from Ukraine and really try to think how we can help. Uh, and thank you very much for your, for, for, for your suggestions and proposals. Uh, because I think it's, of course, something that AE JM can be a kind of the, uh, how can I say, middle maker. Uh, but I think also all of us can, can work together. Sometimes I'm have, I have a feeling, and I'm sorry to say this, but since we in Poland are really close to this war, we are not in the middle as you, Anna, are, but we are like 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers. Sometimes I think that the bigger distances from this, from this country, the, the less we... Um, really feel and see uh, what's going on. And from my very personal point of view, I have to say that for the very first time, I had uh, seen and felt the um, pictures and emotions that I remember I have seen and felt listening to, I don't know, my grandparents, thinking suddenly about really, I'm not even talking about people and refugees, but ev evacuating objects, which is suddenly so very close, I don't think any one of us, even if we have very professional institutions, uh, could really think that it's something that we really should think about. So um, I, I just simply want to say, Anna, that, um, how can I say, whatever is needed, just simply tell us, and I'm sure all of us have colleagues in Ukrainian museums, and I'm really encouraging you all to think about it, how we can help uh, Thank you. Uh, if I can just add, yes, I mean, it's, it's obviously we are still most of all and foremost of all a museum. So for us, also, this is an interesting time to, to witness, just like uh, Barbara has, uh, has mentioned. And I think w w what we do, yes, we're collecting those, those evidences. We're collecting those pictures. We, we create exhibition. And again, we'll be, next week, we're opening an exhibition that is done by the Krakow refugees, by the Ukrainian refugees to Krakow about them. It's called On the Way Home. Uh, and it's important for us to give them space, but also it's important for us to speak with Poles, with Krakowians, because there are also tensions. There are also problems. You know, day one, day fifth, everybody are very moved. This is day 100 uh, or 110. And people are in Krakow, uh, you know, you can hear, oh, it's so crowded. Oh, the Ukrainians are getting free access to doctors. Oh, they are, they are all having been, until now, until the end of uh, May, they had like free communication tickets. And that was creating tensions. And the longer the war lasts, uh, I think the, the, the more tensions will, will grow. So for us, it's important to, keep, to be engaged in the discussion with the fellow Krakowians, to keep explaining them why this is happening, why they, those people are here, what it is that they are looking for, um, and all sorts of, 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 of different things, kind of expecting that they're going to be pushed back. And at some point, it will be just... Um, it may be less or more complicated. Um, so it's, it's important for us. And in terms of this, this entire war, I think it's, it's uh, interesting how 
predefined roles didn't work up this time. I mean, you know, if you do a list of the characteristic features of a poll, generosity for a strangers, not really high on, on, on that list. Yes, selfless uh, help, um, not really high on the list. Uh, if you try to describe, if you think Polish Jewish relations are complicated, Ukrainian Jewish relations are even more complicated. And this is interesting to see that suddenly, I mean, this entire war, if we look for positive sides, maybe this will give a new, it will be a new beginning. It will allow us to redefine those difficult relations we as a Poles had with Ukrainians uh, and uh, Jews and the Israelis had with Ukrainians as well. I mean, what Eastern Europe is interesting because Eastern Europe is all about the past. Mm -hmm. Future doesn't really matter. It's all about the past. If you, uh, again, Barbara has mentioned that recently the uh, Israeli Minister of Education, you know, canceled those tours of youth to Poland. Think about that. It's post-COVID. You know, things are restarting, economy restarting, and so on and so on. It's, it's a war in Ukraine. Bombs are falling 200 kilometers e east. Fuel uh, of, you know, uh, tickets, uh, air, air tickets go, are going crazy high. None of this is the reason to cancel the tours. The, cancel, the reason to canceling the tour is the way we talk about the history. This shows you how important the past is in this part of, 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 of the world. And I think this war is perhaps will give us, again, a, a new beginnings where we'll have a new heroes that will be acceptable by the Poles, by the Jews, and, and you know, Ukrainians will be proud of them too. Yeah, and, and it's really the, the, the history is happening now. Uh, you've mentioned this, that this part of Europe is full of past and there, that there are some shadows. Uh, I think that we as the museums, as the cultural institutions, we are really the place for, for uh, discussions and debates and address this issue. By the way, in Poland, before uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, there was a huge crisis uh, on the eastern borders, border where Polish government and Belarusian government, they built a wall in order not to allow uh, refugees, mainly from Syria uh, and other countries, to cross to the uh, EU. So think about, uh, on one hand, the same country is not allowing uh, children and uh, women to cross the border, and they are really literally freezing in the swamps and forests, while on the same border, 100 kilometers to the south, we are welcoming uh, Ukrainian refugees. So if you think about this contradiction, and if we all think, not about even our government, but ourselves, our society, why are we reacting in this way to certain women and children and in a completely different way to other women and children. So I think we are really now, the, 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 the history is happening and of course um, the, the most painful it's for, it's for Ukrainians, but I think we all as, the, um, as human beings, as humankind, as Europeans, we can think about ourselves, what is, what is it, uh, we can look ourselves in, the, in, in this mirror. I also would like to address what Kuba was saying. I think this very moment is also very interesting for us in order to enrich our collection and think also about our collection strategy. Uh, what um, makes objects in our collection uh, precious? Uh, is it their uh, material val value? Is it this uniqueness? Or is it something that Barbara was mentioning, this kind of this very moment ephemeras. Sure, I mean, when, we, do, when we, we, we work on this exhibition that will be open next week, one of the ideas we had is we ask those people, what, 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 what are the things that you left behind and what are the things that you brought with you, the, the important things? And you know, in the old times we, we collect, people would do what? We, they would carry with them photographs. Uh, these days they would show us, well, we have all the photographs on our mobile phone. So what is important for them, for me, this mobile phone. Uh, you know, obviously there was lots of things that they had to leave behind and, and very moving story. But, but this is kind of a new challenge. I mean, that, that, that suddenly, you know, the, 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 the boxes that, that would our parents or grandparents would fill in with the photographs when, when moving. Today is a SIM card, you can print it, you, you can, you know, this is this different challenge of, 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 of how us 
whether this cell phone is suddenly becoming an object uh, of, of great importance. Um, uh, I'd like to go back, Anna, to my first question to you about your um, community of your museum. Can you tell us about uh, Jewish community in Czerniowce? What is happening to them? Uh, right now, uh, Jewish community is, uh, because Czerniowce is, uh, um, belongs today to, like, let's say, more or less safe city. So we also have very many internally displaced people in the city and Jewish community um, is very active trying to help them to settle in the city which is like also has its difficulties because the city uh, is small and it was not prepared to uh, host such a big number of um, vis visitors coming not just for a visit and so that is why we are trying to stay in touch like for example a few like a few weeks ago i guess the dialogue director opened the museum for on the request from the jewish community to have a meeting with those people like those internally displaced people who are hosted by jewish community to give them a tour to tell them a little bit about the city to help them feel welcome in this city, as you say, like you have these problems in Poland and other in many cities around the Europe where you for it's difficult for Ukrainians to settle in. It's, it's difficult everywhere. When you go to the other city, it's also difficult. You have the same language. So, yeah, but it's still you have to feel you, you leave your home behind. So it's difficult for you. That's why we are trying to do what we can in order to support uh, people support each other and so the Jewish community uh, does a lot in this um, field and if we can help we are trying to do so. Yes please. I just wanted to mention, oh yeah, yeah, now it works. Uh, and another connection that there is as well in Germany in particular, a very big uh, percentage of German Jews have Ukrainian roots. And I was wondering whether um, anybody here uh, who is present here from uh, German Jewish museums have had projects so far uh, with people about this, their own history, their family history. And we have obviously contacts uh, with the Jewish communities. You know, I was recently um, getting in touch with somebody because I wanted to invite them to an event. And they said, oh, sorry, but we have so much to do with all the refugees because there are so many uh, Jewish refugees from Ukraine. Mm. I don't know whether anybody works on a project or... From German museums? Yeah, well, just because that's another connection, you know, that's, yeah. I'm not from a German museum, as you know, but I would like to say that there are also a number of refugees in Germany with Russian roots, and that what I'm missing in this whole discussion is the problem that the bloodlands are populated by Ukrainian and by Russian Jews. And I wonder why we do not talk about that problem. What is the population of this Jewish community? Can I ask them? Can I ask her? Have you, have you heard, Anna? The question is about uh, population the, of Jewish community in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the Jewish communities, um, we cannot say for sure because um, we haven't heard the population census for many, many years already. Uh, I, it's a small community right now. I would say around maybe 2,000 people most. It's uh, the Jewish community is is really uh, right now is a very small one in China. Would you like Kuba or Anna to answer to Felicita's question? Well, uh, we, with with all the activities that we do, 
we are doing them open. I mean, we're not we're not targeting any particular group. So we, if you're bringing your kid to the daycare center, we don't ask whether you're Jewish, Polish Jewish, Ukrainian Jewish, Russian Jewish, Jewish at all. Uh, it's it's uh, it's absolutely. Um, for everybody, so that's kind of what we try to do is to help. In terms of, in terms of, uh, yes, I mean we are in very pe pe peculiar moment in time, when unlike uh, if you ask me what the museum is for, I would very much say that the museum is precisely to touch upon the conflict zones, to look at the, the places that hurts, and then to investigate those those areas of of conflict, of misunderstanding, not because of the pure joy, but because this is what will keep us going forward. But now in this particular moment in time, in terms of, uh, of, of, of the war in Ukraine, in our actions, yes, we understand that we could talk about very horrible things that happened in the Ukraine a long time ago. We, 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 you know, again, Ukrainian and Jewish relations were very, very complicated. Uh, um, and one of the things for the future is the question, I mean, how this war will affect the way the Holocaust is remembered in Ukraine, whether Ukrainian people, and there's lots of positive things that started to happen in Ukraine over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Now, assuming that the war ends with happy end, Russians go back to Russia, Ukrainians are celebrating victory, whether they will have time and energy to commemorate the vic Jewish victims from 80 years ago or not because of the Bucha, because of the Mariupol, because of all those things. How this space will, 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 will look like in, 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 you know, when the, this is over. How, how, these are things that are interesting for us, those relations in the triangle, triangle between the Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles. But at this time, at least in our museum, we hold on from doing, doing those discussion, difficult discussions in that area. I mean, this is, we, this is our conscious decision not to look at this now. Uh, when people are still coming in, crying, their fathers, their parents are in, in, in Ukraine. And we've got those you know, emails from our friends from different places around the world that listen. I have this wonderful exhibition about my family story uh, and they, they all died in the Holocaust. One person survived. I would be happy to, to meet with your uh, kids and do workshops about my family. And we say, well, that's very important and so on, so on, but that's not the time because their parents, their fathers, their brothers, their uncles are still there fighting uh, or just trying to survive. So how about we, we do it some, some, some day later? So I think it's, it's hard for us to get you know, to, from those predefined situations, predefined roles, uh, understanding that now what is needed is victory, is help, is food, is gasoline, is work, is job, is safety, um, all sorts of things. Uh, yes, please. Mm. Um, Anja Siegemond, Stiftung Neue Synagoge Berlin. Um, well, I, I, totally, I totally understand what you're saying, that it's not now uh, time uh, uh, for people from Ukraine or also for you to engage now with, uh, with other things than what you're doing. But I do understand Felicita's question very well. Maybe in the context uh, of Germany, um, Barbara was, was before, and I think very rightly saying, well, as Jewish museums, we have to uh, look um, at communities and we have to be somehow, um, well, have them as partners at least and so on and so forth. So of course we have to be aware, and this is very much the case in Germany, that there's, uh, there's in the communities, there's many people from Ukraine and there's many people from Russia, and this is a problem. And I'm not saying those who are from Russia, they are, um, of course, they are not all of them are in favor of Putin or something that is not true, but there is, there is many conflicts uh, going on. And looking at the German society, of course, there's also this, uh, this very complex situation that people, for example, they are, uh, or they are, um, wie sagt man gehindert? Hindered. Oh, well. <laughs> so in this case, German is English. Okay, they are hindered to uh, to celebrate eight of eighth of May, or uh, and so on and so forth. And that is a problem, right? I think this is what you were addressing. 
So, so we have to do this complex as well. And, and of course you are right. This doesn't mean anything that, you know, people like Anna have to, you, you, you don't have to address this, but maybe we have to. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's what we were also, I understand that I appreciate your question, Felicitas. The, the closer you are to this uh, uh, center of, 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 of evil, of this tragedy that is happening, the less you are capable to be this kind of objective museologist. And I think this is our problem for now. Uh, and for sure, uh, it's as you hear, when you, if you hear, when you hear what, what, what Chernyovce Museum is doing now, you can understand that they are not behaving as, I would say, pre-war museum. The few hundred kilometers further, we are also not behaving as the uh, objective museum. But I think there will be time when we should really uh, address this issue. But f as for now, uh, personally, me, or Koba or, or Anna for sure, we are yet too close. And this is also this idea of um, uh, addressing conflicts and challenges. And it's very, very hard to be this kind of trans transparent museologist if you are really very close to, to this situation. Mm. Yes, please. Y yes, please. I think it's not a question of being objective or um, and or being too close to the um, to the war. I think it's um, it's even a, a question of being so close. In, um, for example, the Augsburg community is um, situated um, in the same building as the museum, so we have to deal with the community. And if um, if someone uh, tells me that he is Russian and he can say anything because he is afraid of his fa that his family will be arrested if he says if he says something against the war so that's um, that's the point when you are involved and that's the point if uh, when you you are um, thinking about okay what can I do without getting these people in danger because these are people too and the and they are afraid so um, that's no excuse to do nothing um, but I think um, you have to look um, at, the, at the different museums at the different communities and, um, and the most important thing is that we um, we help each other as human beings. Well, I, I, I absolutely understand, and I think for on top of everything, for us, this war, we're in this convenient situation of a, of a witness where we can sit and, and just, just, just look at what happens. I think for us, this is also a reminder why the things that we do matters because this is how it ends, with lack of democratic state, with, with lack of education, with lack of uh, free speech, with lack of uh, uh, society, with tyrants, this is how it ends. Every single time it ends with war, with innocent people being killed. This is why when Putin now to, t to, to, to change the, 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 the curse of, of Russia is very difficult. Uh, that's why we need to, to, to look at those beginnings. And for, this is important for us. You know, Poland has been struggling with our right-wing government. We've seen lots of problems. And with the, in, in, in Russia and in Ukraine, we see how it ends. In, in, in Poland, in, in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, we see how it starts. That's why it's so important for us to keep talking, to keep doing, because at some point it's just too late. At some point, we're talking about evacuating and saving and, and helping. Uh, this is what we need to keep reminding ourselves, that we do it because things like this happen. And we have time, all of us, and uh, with exception of Anna, we still have time to do something. Yes. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very, very much.
I, if I may just add uh, to this conversation and um, uh, first of all, thank you for what you are doing in your countries for um, Ukrainians. I'm very grateful as a, per, as a Ukrainian and as, as a museum worker. Uh, second of all, I wish, I hope it, it ends soon because honestly, I cannot describe you how um, terrible that is. Uh, when, you, when we are trying to, when I'm, while I was here with you today, think, hearing to what you are saying as a museum professional and for like half an hour, I guess I tried to switch off my feeling, my, my emotions and think of, yes, like what you said about positive things of this war that um, might happen in that. But on the other side, every single week, there are funerals in our cities of a young men who were not born as soldiers. They were not meant to fight and they, uh, they never wanted to go to the front line. And we are, they are doing what they do right now because they have to and people lost their lives and this is very difficult to uh, think of that and to think of that uh, from the objective side. It, it, it's almost important, uh, impossible. When I was trying to think what are we are going to do uh, as a museum um, after the war, because for, for a moment you want to decide, to, like you want to think let's plan something when the war is over let's think of something when it, it already everything is in the past and now i realize how difficult it's going to be for our museum to talk about the topics that we used to talk before because there is too much pain for our kids for our for our people you know my uh, friend who has a six-year-old daughter once told me that after they hosted their relatives from Bucha, a town near Kiev where Russians uh, did absolutely inhuman things. So uh, this, fa this family managed to escape before the, uh, like when it was uh, the most uh, terrible there, but still that was very, very, very um, difficult. And so after this six year old girl, talk to other kids from, from this family. In a while, she asked her mom if that, is, if that was okay for her right now to smile and to laugh, if, if that is okay. So while, because, and this is a question that a six year old is asking, what can you say about those who are older who understand much more? And when I'm thinking that as a museum educator, because that's what I was doing, uh, while I was working on the permanent basis in the museum, while we were talking about the Holocaust, about uh, suffering of the children. And so now it is gonna be much more difficult for us because uh, right now it is much more vivid. It's not only the past, it's what's happening in the present. No one could believe that, but it is. So uh, obviously as I, I I wish this time come already when we uh, have to deal with that problem because that means that it's over. But, and I understand that we will try to find some ways, but for now it's, it's still a war and it is happening here right in the middle of the Europe for, I, I, don't, I, I don't know why it is happening. Like there is no, uh, there is no, no, like, no, for no reason, because some lunatic decided to have his Russian empire extended, but still. So thank you for what you're doing, but I, I hope that it, it, it ended soon and maybe then we will ask for your help finding the solution to talk about these difficult problems, because probably we would need some people with clear mind talking about that because our minds, our heads, uh, I don't know if we would be able to find the way. It, it's just too painful right now. Thank you very much, Anna, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you very much for quite an intense discussion, very important discussion. We will pick up on the suggestions also as AGM, what to, as AGM board, what to do and how to proceed. I actually quite like the idea of a small pop-up kind of thing that we would do jointly, but it's not, uh, it's not for today to decide, but it's something to start to work on right away. Um, back to the more practical, I repeat that those of you who want to, uh, we're going to the dinner reception now, only for those who enlisted, but if you don't know whether you did, ask Jonathan, and if you did, but you don't like to, tell him, because other people might want to go. Um, so there's many, there's, there's still a lot of variety possible there. Um, Rivka Aimona will, will be walking, um, Sarah Susan will be taking public transport, and some of you can go on their own and they will take the address from the board in the back. I look forward to seeing you uh, either tonight in the Jewish community or tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock.